I guess it was in 2014, uh, we had a conversation, I think it was at 92nd Street Y, and I could be wrong, but I got the impression from that conversation that you were doing a lot of, a lot of work, a lot of self-reflection to try to come to terms with your own religiosity. No. <laughs> and, um, and so, but, but uh, that's exactly right. So you came out with a very strong uh, position on that. Um, but, you know, as, as time goes by, people get older, sometimes their view shifts. So you can just give me a yes or no on this. Has anything changed in that regard since we last spoke? Absolutely not, no. Can you hear me? I don't think you can. Can you? Yes, I think we... Uh, Could somebody fix my... You know, uh, we don't know each other that well, but, um, you know, this is how you get to know the person that you're going to be conversing with. You can just get that right in there. Is that tight? It's the second time it's come off. I think that's good, right? Well, let's try to go with that and see how that goes. Okay. Good. So, anyway, so, um, so uh, nothing's changed. No, thank God. That's uh, great. Um, <laughs> and, um, you, know, the, the, you know, when I think about the big questions... I tend to organize them into origin of the universe, origin of life, and origin of mind. And I'm actually teaching a course with that theme at Columbia. And we read the selfish gene, this term, as part of that. I hadn't read it since I was in college. So, you know, it was spectacular to, to re-engage with the wonderful book that you gave the world. A question came up in the class. All right. And um, I would like to check with you to see if the answer I gave Makes, makes sense and aligns with your thinking. So the question a couple of kids asked was, look, we read this book and we get a very clear sense of, of evolution, you know, the gene as the basic unit of heredity, but we're still left with the question, what is life and how did life get started? So my response to that, which some of them found quite um, unsatisfying, is that that's not as precise a question as you think. Right? I mean, in some sense, trying to draw the line between animate and inanimate and trying to have a very precise definition ultimately amounts to words, right? It's a continuum from, from inanimate to animate. And once we have the molecular Darwinism in place rolling forward, life just emerges in that continuum. So my question to you is, is that a reasonable way of describing I, it? I think it is. Um... I think that there's a too great a tendency in the human mind to try to draw lines and to try to, where there, where there is a spectrum. I mean, sometimes there really is a line, but in other cases there isn't. And we should not insist that there has to be a line. Well, in the case of life, I suppose you could sort of see a kind of line when the first self-replicating entity came into existence, because that was the moment when natural selection and hence Darwinian evolution could start. You can't get natural selection unless you've got something equivalent to a gene. So the first gene, which would not have been DNA, by the way, but the, f the first gene um, would be a kind of watershed event, I suppose. But I agree with you. We, we don't want to get too hung up on the questions of definition, which dim like a definition of life as opposed to non-life, right. which demand a particular moment at which life came into existence. And when you say first gene, in that context, can I think of it as the first molecule that discovers this capacity for making copies of itself, period? Yes, making copies of itself, and that would include making copies of errors in itself. Right. Um, so that there, there has to be variety in the population of these replicating entities. The reason I say it wouldn't have been DNA is that DNA has been described as a high-tech replicator that requires a rather complicated infrastructure of biochemistry in order to, to do its replication. So people in the field agree that the first replicator would not have been DNA. It would have been something else that had the property of self-replication, probably much less efficient at it than DNA. And DNA would have been a late usurper of that role. It could have been RNA. And do you think it was RNA? Is I don't know. I mean, that, that, that's a current fashionable idea. That, and the reason it's fashionable is that, um, as you know, there's a kind of divide in, in biochemistry between the protein, which acts as enzyme, 
and, and the, the variety of enzymes which is the key to everything that goes on in, in, in life. The fact that the three-dimensional form of a protein molecule, when it coils up into a sort of knot, which gives it its enzymatic properties, and that is determined by the um, one-dimensional sequence of amino acids, which in turn is determined by the one-dimensional sequence of uh, DNA. Um, so there's this double act between DNA and protein. Uh, D DNA is not an enzyme, it's an excellent replicator. Protein is an excellent enzyme, but cannot replicate. Uh, RNA is kind of moderate at both. So uh, if, if, R if it started off with RNA, that could have done both the enzyme role, because en RNA is a kind of rather bad enzyme. Right. and a kind of rather bad replicator, but it can do both roles. And so the idea is then that DNA would have come in and usurped the replication role, and protein then came in and usurped the enzyme role. So how, how big, how big a molecule do you imagine this first replicator would be? I suppose it would be quite small, the, the, the first one. Right, I mean... Uh, but I, I don't know. I mean, this is, this is an, an active field of... Well, I suppose research, but very speculative research. Right. Because, you know, you'll see people making the argument that whatever molecule you put forward as the first one, if it has some degree of complexity associated with it, you can then ask yourself, you know, what are the odds yeah. that that molecule will yeah. form? And when that number is necessarily quite small, some people see a tension with the naturalness of the process yeah. and the yeah. unlikelihood that it would happen. So how, it, how do you answer that? It, well, it, it, it is a field where, where the, there, there is no answer yet, and, and people are not, are not confident of, of it. Um, there, are, there are various problems with the so-called uh, Catch-22, um, that, you, that, 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 that you can't get um, DNA without protein and vice versa. Right. Um, there, are, uh, there are other problems with it. Um, some people have favored what they call a hypercycle, where um, there are various stages in, the, in, a, in, a, in a chain, and each stage gives rise to the next. So there is no one molecule is the is the key replicator. The entire hypercycle um, is is the key is the is the replicator. Um, but it's it's not a field which has been solved. It's not a question which has been answered. Um, it is still conceivable that the origin of life, the origin of the self replication, the origin of uh, natural selection was a stupendously improbable event. Right. Uh, and the, the corollary of that would be that there's no other life in the universe. I mean, or put it the other way, if you want to believe that there is only one life form in the universe, which you're entitled to do, um, then it, a corollary of that is that the origin of life on this planet must have been a, a fantastically improbable event, so much so that any theory we come up with has got to be a very implausible theory. Right. Because if it were plausible, <laughs> there would be life all over the universe. Yes. Which I suspect there probably is. And just saying that if you want to believe that life only arose once, then what you're looking for in a theory of the origin of life is not a plausible theory such as you could replicate in a chemistry lab. So, I mean, so there is a lot of evidence that all life on Earth comes from a common single-celled ancestry. Yes, the, ev the evidence for that is, is that the DNA code is all but universally the same in every living form that's ever been examined. And the odds of that coming about convergently is extremely low. So I think just about everybody is convinced that every single life form, at least those that have been looked at, it descends from a common ancestor. It's because it's got the same machine code at its base. There now, are does, that, does that strike you as, as a puzzle or just something that we need no, to No, I don't think it's a puzzle. I mean, it, it, it could be that more than one life form arose originally. And we just don't see and, them. And, we don't, and, and as Darwin said originally, Darwin said um, one of them ate up all the others. Right. So that, that, that's a possibility. Paul Davies, your physics colleague, um, thinks it's worth looking to see if there are other life forms. They, just, they may be around on Earth, but never been, been found. Um, I, I liken that to the 
looking for your keys under the lamppost. And when somebody had lost his keys, and so he's looking under, under the lamppost for the keys. And somebody else asks him, why are you looking under the lamppost? Is that where you lo lost your keys? No, but that's where the light is. Right. So, um, uh, if we're asking the question, is there life elsewhere in the universe? We can't go elsewhere in the universe yet. It's very difficult to... Well, the, the, so let's look But the here. universe can't come to us, and some have suggested that maybe the origin, you know, life in some yes. form may have come here on a, you know, um, on a meteor, or got yes. pummeled off of yes. Mars. Well, that, that's not so implausible as it, it was once thought to be. Yeah. Um, it's the theory of panspermia, um, invented by a Swedish, um, a Swedish biologist called Arrhenius uh, yeah, about a century ago now. Um, and it was espoused by Fred Hoyle, the astronomer, very distinguished astronomer, but he, he kind of went adrift a bit on, on evolution anyway. Um, directed panspermia is a, is a more far-fetched idea, which was actually favoured, I think, a bit tongue-in-cheek. You mean that actually someone sent it yes. here to, I mean, to seed life? Uh, Francis Crick, the, 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 the great um, co-discoverer of the structure of DNA, um, together with Leslie Orgel, suggested that, um, we, that our planet could have been deliberately seeded by an alien civilization. I, I think it was a joke. I mean, I, I mean they, they sort of presented it as though it was a serious theory. But, but, right. Um, um, so, so when you consider the, the rich spectrum of life on Earth that all, say, arose from this singular starting point. Do you find that the, the range is sensible relative to the environment that life found itself trying to adapt to? Or do you find it strange that we don't have you know, beings with you know, nine eyes or eyes that work under completely different principles or I don't know, some being that would be sensitive to gravitational waves. Yes. And, you know. now that, I'm very fascinated by that kind of question. Um, and you can get a long way by looking around the animal kingdom and, and, and asking how many times different things have evolved. And you can work out how many times they've evolved because you can work out what the tree of life actually is. You, you know which animals are close relations of, of, of which. So we know, for example, that there are, I think it's nine different principles of eyes, different, really? different ways of doing, doing the optics. And that eyes have evolved independently several dozen times. One estimate is, is more than 40 times. Really? Um, so eyes actually evolve with great ease, with great frequency. Um, and they're got, all sensitive to the same part of the spectrum because uh, of the not sun? Not exactly the same, but it's overlapping. Right. Uh, insect eyes move towards the ultraviolet, for example. Um, but it, it's, it's nice to think that all the ways of making an eye that physicists have thought of have been thought of by evolution um, in, in rather interesting ways. I mean, the, com the compound eye works in a totally different way from the camera eye, which is what, which is what we have. There are mollusks which have a, a, a reflector eye, a, 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 a parabolic reflector. You mean like a radio dish out there? Yes, really? yes. But, but optical. Wow. Uh, so... Um, that there are scallops that have that. Have that. Um, and there are lots of different kinds of compound eye, lots of different kinds of camera eye. Um, and they've evolved independently. Other things like, say, um, echolocation, navigating by sonar, by, by sound waves, that's evolved four times independently uh, in bats, whales, and two different families of birds, cave-dwelling birds, in independently. So that's rather more reluctant to evolve, but nevertheless right. it has evolved more than once. Some things have evolved only once, and so you feel they're improbable things. Right. Mm. So, so in trying to understand the likelihood or not of the emergence of life, and therefore to try to gain some insight into the question that you made reference to, whether we're alone or there's other life out there in the universe, you know, sometimes people write down this, um, this Drake equation, which I, every time I see it, I always feel like it's, it's misrepresenting the situation because it's not so much an equation 
describing the actual likelihood of the arising of life. It's more a way of uh, encapsulating our ignorance of yeah. the whole variety of qualities of the universe mm. that we really don't have any insight into. So any number that comes out of it is really just totally dependent on the ignorance that we have regarding the numbers that go into it. But, but be that as it may, when, when you think about that life may have just started once on this planet, does that diminish your expectation that the search for extraterrestrial life will be successful? Well, we can't escape from the fact that it did arise on this planet. I mean, yeah. That's a, it's a, it's, it's, so it's a sample it's size a, of one, and yes. what do you do with that? I would love another one. I mean, it, it, yeah. it, 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 um, because we just don't know. And I'm, I'm very intrigued by the question how much of what we know about this, this form of life yeah. had to be so, because there's only one way for it to be. For example, does there have to be a, something like a gene? I think the answer is yes. Does it have to be... I mean, just because you need something to, care, to, 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 to do propagate w, the information. Yeah. Right. Um, does it have to be a one-dimensional array? Does it have to be digital? Right. I think it probably has to be digital. Does digital it, because otherwise errors would too creep much, in too, too, too quickly. Too much error, yes. Right. Um, does it have to be a one-dimensional string of data, which DNA is? And I don't think that's clear. I, mean, I could imagine a two-dimensional matrix, right. um, which could be read. Not three-dimensional, because you can't get inside the, um, right. the, the three-dimensional blob. Um, so that's kind of question. Does there have to be sex? Would you expect to get eyes? I, I, I bet you'd get eyes. Um, because, because eyes have happened so many times here. But presumably if it was a star that emitted strongly in a completely different part of the spectrum, then that's maybe you, sensitivity sure, there yes. or something of that sort. Yes, yes, exactly. So, um, so it leads to, to the question then. Um, if you had your choice, in some sense, as to what we would find if we encountered life in another world, would you want it to be the same in order that you would have a unified theory of life in some sense? Or would you rather it be different so that now you just see this grand spectrum of possibility with us just being one of many? I'd be delighted by either. I mean, if, right. if, it, if, it, were, if it were too similar, if for, <clears throat> if, for example, you found life on Mars and it was DNA-based and the DNA code was the same... Right. Then, then it's I, probably the same. Then it's got to be contamination. Right. Um, because we, kn we know that... So we mean we're Martians. It could have come from there. It could and have come from right. there. It, right. But we, we know that a lot of meteorites have come from, from Mars. So right. That, so, but if, it's, um, if it were DNA but a different DNA code, that would be rivetingly exciting. Right. If it were not DNA but something like... You know, another... Um, uh, polymer, um, gosh, it would be fascinating, it would yeah. be amazing. Um, I think it would be the most exciting discovery ever, actually, to find, to find something like, like that. I, I mean, we, we, as you say, we've got a sample of one. L life on this planet is uniform at the biochemical level. Even, even great big creatures like us, we do our biochemistry quite largely using tricks that were discovered by primordial bacteria, and, yeah. they, and many of them are in us doing the same trick. We've just simply commandeered them. Yeah, that would be hugely so, exciting. Almost as exciting as string theory or something like that. Yeah. Uh, um, we'll come on to that. <laughs> yeah. But um, so, 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 you know, as we enter an age when we can begin to actually tinker with the actual structure of life, say CRISPR, Cas9, um, do you imagine that we'll be able to gain some insight into these questions in the laboratory as opposed to... I think, yes, to I mean, I, I would, I, whenever I meet a biochemist, I always ask them, can you imagine an alternative biochemistry? Could yeah. you construct an alternative biochemistry? Right. Or if you can't construct it, at least Im imagine it. Um, does it have to be carbon-based, for example? I think the answer to that is probably yes. Would you agree with that? Or well, I mean, carbon is certainly the natural go-to species if I didn't know anything about life and you gave me a list of criterion that you want to have a very active molecule, you want it to be able to bond with all sorts of other molecules in the environment, you want it to be uh, uh, a species that's commonplace so that it's not a rare species that we deal with. But um, there are other pretty active species too. Well, um, silicon is, is mentioned yeah, right, as, for as example, an element which, which could, could possibly do the same job. Right. 
Um, but um, I asked Harry Croto, the famous organic yeah, sure, chemist, yeah. and he, he's confident it'll be... That, that it'll have to be carbon-based. Uh, yeah, it has to be carbon-based. But that leaves a lot of freedom, nevertheless. I mean, even, even within carbon, with, even within organic chemistry, an enormous freedom to, to devo devise alternative biochemistries. Right. Now, do you, do you think that there will come a point when we just can create life from scratch in the laboratory? I mean, is that in our future? Yes. Uh, I think so, yes. I mean, well, Craig Venter has already created... Well, sort of. ...replica, I mean, uh, yeah. just sort of re re reproduced the same thing. Um, but, uh, yes, yeah, so... so I mean, do you want to say what Craig has done just to... Uh... Well, um, he, he has re recreated um, a particular bacterium from scratch. Um, but it's, it is just, a, just one that already existed. Right. Well, if you can do that then you could theoretically create one that doesn't exist already. Uh, and and um, uh, so, we, and from that I suppose you could eat, might even go ahead, go on to multicellular right. life. And so, you know, does, does this, I mean, obviously this is an exciting possibility. Does it scare you? It excites me more than it scares me. Um, I, I, I'm just fascinated by it and by the, the, the possibilities. So I'm, uh, I do think we have to exercise a precautionary principle. And how, do you, how, do, how would you imagine doing that? As, do you know Sidney Brenner, a great molecular biologist? Uh, not African? personally, yeah. Keep the lid on your Petri dish well screwed down, he said. <laughs> you know, but any, any you know, uh, you know, criterion and, and restrictions you place in this country or in your country, right? I mean, this is not a worldwide type of... Um, no. So... But there have been attempts. I mean, there was, there was a meeting of molecular biologists at one point to sort of devise a kind of moratorium list of things that you, you mustn't do, and I think it, it held for a while. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I suppose a, a greater, more present worry would be if um, the techniques of creating of, of, or of varying um, microorganisms were to fall into the wrong hands. I mean, biological warfare yeah. has been experimented on by some of the great powers, and if, that, if the techniques fell into the hands of terrorists, um, it, it, especially if the terrorists, for religious reasons, want to die, and therefore don't care whether they destroy the world. Right. Um, it, it, the, I think that's probably more of a worry than, than the kind of thing you were raising of, right. of creating life. Uh, but, the, uh, but the bottom line then um, summary, if, if I'm hearing you correctly, is you would agree presumably the statement that whatever, 100 years or 500 years from now, people will look back at this era and sort of smile at the mystery that we once thought was embedded in life and it will just be another concoction of chemicals that happens to be able to carry out certain processes and people will shrug as opposed to revere this entity that forms, at least on this planet. I suppose if, the le if there's a lesson from history that we, always one can look back on earlier e eras and feel that way, yes. Well, I mean, you know, at the end of the... Uh, you know, in 19th century, there's a famous statement in physics that I'm sure you're familiar with. Lord Kelvin is usually credited with saying it. It's unclear that he actually did. That, you know, all the laws of physics were worked out except, you know, this or that constant of nature that needed to be evaluated to the sixth or seventh decimal place. And, of course, that was before the discovery of special relativity, general relativity, quantum mechanics. So it's spectacularly wrong. It's spectacularly short-sighted. Yes, yes. Um, but um, do you think it's possible that there is a discovery, a, a phase, a step on par, say, with quantum mechanics, which, you know, for physicists is the revered step in our understanding of the natural world, that we're completely missing right now. Yes, a different kind of precautionary principle. You've got to be precautionary about what you say and not fall into the Lord Kelvin um, era. Right. Um, I think it was Lord Kelvin also said, um, radio will turn out to be a hoax. Um, um, and um, what else did he say? Um, I well, don't know if I know that one. Uh, he said, um, uh, heavier than air flight is impossible. 
Um, uh, Jeez, you're really taking my hero and just cutting the legs out of him. Well, no, he was a great physicist for his time. Um, but <laughs> he, he, also, um, he also gave Darwin some grief because... Wow, he I opened a can of worms here. This yeah. is fantastic. Yeah, go ahead. He gave Darwin some grief because he calculated that uh, the sun was too young ah, to sure. have allowed time for evolution, and that's because he thought the sun was a fire, burning, burning fuel, um, and had no way of, of knowing that the sun is a nuclear reactor. And, and so um, Darwin was in, intimidated because physics was the, was the senior science, and so it, in a way, Kelvin kind of came a bit heavy on Darwin and, and, and said, well, physics proves evolution not possible. What Darwin should have said, well, the evidence for evolution is overwhelming, so your physics must be wrong. <laughs> Touche. <Yeah. laughs> so, so um, you know, if we go from, from life to intelligence, you know, conscious self-awareness, there's a similar collection of puzzles, obviously different in detail, but revered by many through the centuries. And in the modern era, you know, David Chalmers is famous, you know, down, down at NYU now, famous for articulating the so-called hard problem of consciousness, right? The problem that if matter is all there is, matter and fields, and if electrons and quarks and the entities that they build up, protons and neutrons, if they have no inner world, if the lights aren't on inside an electron, if it has no inner sensation, if a third person account precisely describes what's going on with an electron, there's nothing else. How could it possibly be that when these particles swirl together, they somehow generate an inner sensation, a quality that simply is absent at the level of the fundamental ingredients? Mm. So, you know, he was dividing up the problems in, in neuroscience and brain science into those that have to do with the mechanism, the function of the brain, which ultimately are, can be difficult to work out, but it's clear what to do to figure out, you know, what's going on when, you know, my arm goes up and down, what sort of brain signals are making that happen. But he considered a qualitatively different question to be the one that I was referring to, namely, how can yeah. the lights turn on? Do, do, you, do you see that distinction? Well, I always confess myself baffled by it. I, I mean, I, I do see it as a, as a deep, as a profoundly difficult problem. I am committed to the view that it, that there is nothing there other than physics. There's nothing there other than, um, as, as you say, atoms and electrons. Um. And where does, where, I mean, I agree with you, hmm. but where does that sensibility come from? Is it based on evidence? Um, I suppose it comes from the feeling that, um, as an evolutionist, we start with physics, we st and then we get chemistry, and um, we get an, a process, Darwinian natural selection, which gradually builds up nervous systems step by step. They get more and more complicated. Um, I cannot under... I can't... I can't see any other way but that. Um, I, Could that be limited mental acuity and creative powers? I think it has to be that, uh, but um, I... I um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm more curious to know what you think, but as a, as a physicist... Um, I thought I was asking the question. No, well, no, it's good. No, no, we, we, we actually were going to go back and forth on questions. And um, I, I, I agree. I can't imagine that there's something beyond Schrodinger's equation of quantum mechanics and the interactions with the particles that's going on inside this physical structure inside of my head. But I still feel deeply puzzled Certainly. by how it is that I can sit here and have this, this inner world. Everything that we do in physics, and think science more generally, is so focused on the third person account. We can look out, objectively see data in the world, find the patterns in that data, articulate the patterns in mathematical equations, use the mathematical equations to predict what's gonna happen next, or the probability of what's gonna happen next in a quantum mechanical framing, and that's what we do. We never have this turn inward to try to have that same kind of rigor and description of what's happening inside of our heads. Now, what David Chalmers says is, 
He says that's, that's, that's not just a small issue. That's a huge issue, if I understand what he's saying correctly. He's saying we perhaps are missing a side of the story which would endow perhaps electrons and quarks and other particles with a degree of proto-consciousness. Maybe there's something beyond mass and charge and spin. Maybe there's something there, and only by taking into account that quality that we've been missing can a lot of those particles yield the sensations that yeah. we're all having right now. It starts to sound dangerously like Deepak Chopra, if you're not careful. Well, um, <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll, I'll tell David that you, that you said that. Uh, but um, I mean, I, I'm also yeah. um, intrigued by philosophers' thought experiments where they say things like, imagine that you could um, make an exact copy of, your, of every single yeah. atom of, your, of, you, of you. And, yeah. and, and, there, are, and um, there, are, there are two of you standing side by side. Which one, which one is yours? I, I have no doubt that they're both. Yes, but then, yeah. but then um, presumably you would, you would have the same consciousness. Yeah, same but memories. Then, but then they would... Diverge. Start to drift. They would start to drift, drift apart. Yeah, so there'd be yeah. two of me. Yes. You know, I'm not sure that would be such a good thing for the world. But um, yeah, that, that's, that's, uh, on, on, on that question, I feel, I feel secure in saying that. Uh, obviously, if one day we can do this, it'll be the best way to find out. But part of that sensibility for me, and I'm wondering if it's the same for you, I don't think that consciousness has to take place inside a particular physical structure, you know, the human brain or the brain of any other, any other animal. You know, I think that once you replicate the function, you've replicated the experience. Do you? Do you? Yeah, and, and I mean, I think if you, if you could somehow upload everything into a computer, that, that, that also would have to have our consciousness. And, and, but but the, these, I, I agree with David Chalmers, it is the hard problem, and it's certainly too hard for me uh, but, I'm, but I wouldn't take the leap to say that, therefore, I know something like, you know, every atom must have a little smidgen of consciousness right. or something like no, that. No, I don't think he took that step um, without a, a, a great deal of difficulty, with yeah. basically banging into every possible avenue that he pursued for many years, yeah. and, and it almost felt like there was no other place to turn. Um, and having not gone through the journey that he and others who spend their lives trying to figure out consciousness mm. uh, have gone through, mm. it's hard to know whether I or perhaps even you would feel the same way after hitting wall after wall yeah. after yeah. wall. Mm. Uh, but it's certainly the case that um, um, even on planet Earth, where we discuss that life may have had a unique origin, the arising of intelligence and conscious self-awareness that also seems to have been a miraculously improbable event that allowed that to happen. Yes. Right? I, I mean, mean, what if the meteor hadn't wiped out the dinosaurs? I mean, would we all be sitting here and we'd all be dinosaurs and having this conversation, or would we never have uh, gotten to that place? I suspect not. I mean, I think, I think that we, there would be lots of dinosaurs around, but, it, but it's... Yeah. it's but we would, I, yeah. I think it's a, I think it's a, it's a major step. We were talking about whether the origin of life was a big step, and perhaps it was. Um, so we don't, that, as I said, that was a corollary of whether we think there's life elsewhere. So, it, so there might be swarms all over the universe of bacterial type yeah. life, but if we ever discovered life elsewhere, it would have to be by radio waves coming in, and that means it would have to be technologically sophisticated life, and that means it would have to have overcome another barrier, so that the barrier from bacterial level life maybe there are several in intermediate ones, and then up to the kind of life that's capable of producing radio waves that we can detect. Right, so long if it's far enough away. I mean, if it's near enough by, in principle, we could... If it's near enough by, yes, but I'm, I'm, I'm suspecting that's probably not. Um, I suspect that if we ever do discover extraterrestrial life, it will be by SETI, by... by and in, in that case, we have the question, do we have a second barrier, or maybe a third or a fourth barrier, right. and pr to produce the sort of intelligence? We don't have to get into consciousness. I mean, it could be unconscious, but it... But, if but it could it, talk it, to us, that would be good but, enough. But right. if, it, if, it, if it can produce radio sig signals, right. then that, that's... An, and that's a much more mundane question than the question of whether, whether the light, as you say, the consciousness sure. light is turned so, on. So do you think you... I mean, if we, if we discovered life that's not intelligent, um, 
would it make much of a difference ultimately to life here? I mean, it would be an exciting moment and so on, but would it then, you know, you know, we have what? You know, it used to be that you had a, a week news cycle, a 24-hour news cycle. Now it's like every 10 minutes. So yes. would this be like from 10.30 to 10.34, bacteria found yeah. on Mars, and then by 11 o'clock, Trump would do something else and everyone forget about it? I, I like to think that it, that it would change the way we think about our own life, but it, maybe, maybe it wouldn't. I think it, it, it really would if we, if we were contacted by intelligent life forms elsewhere, especially as if it was intelligent enough to get its signals here, it would have to be a lot higher level than us. Uh, and so we would, be that we would have a lot more to learn from them than they would learn from us. And so right. um, that really ought to shake our confidence and shake our... Um, now, if it was far away, it would be a pretty slow conversation. You couldn't have a conversation, right. though, that's right. Um, but you could listen to them. Right. Um, um, so, so let's say we did have this conversation going. Let's say we get over the barrier, somehow we learn how to communicate with each other and fancifully, let's imagine that the conversation happens yeah. more quickly than, yeah, you know... 500 year in, yeah, interval or, between... Yeah, so so, so yeah, let's put yeah. all that to the side yeah. for just a second, yeah. uh, which is certainly a technical detail. Could you imagine that the logic by which this intelligent extraterrestrial society lived and thought and work and created would be fundamentally different from the logic here. That I love that question. With. I mean, I... I you, you, you've heard this question before? I mean, well, is this frequently asked you? I feel so hackneyed. No, I thought no, it was a good question. It's a, no, that's I why love I say that I question. love it. I mean, uh, um, I, I mean um, clearly they would have Pythagoras' theorem. Um, they would have um, uh, numbers. They'd have geometry. They'd have... Um, but I, I'm... Like you, I'm curious to know whether they'd have a completely different kind of um, question that we don't, we don't have. Because there are, in mathematics, you're probably familiar with, uh, different kinds of logics. Yes. And, you know, uh, they're, they're interesting mathematically. People study these logics. You know, there's, you know, multivariate logic where it's not just true or false. It can be somewhere in between. You know, there's a subject called quantum logic, which in some sense is modeled on quantum mechanics, where, you know, it's not just the particles here or over here, but it's, you know, some quantum mechanical mixture of the two. So, so is it conceivable that one of those or some other kind of logic would, would yield a kind of engagement with the universe that's utterly distinct from ours. Well, it's sometimes suggested that the, 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 the way in which we think, which is not the way quantum theorists think, but the way people think, ordinary people think, um, is di dictated by what's the necessary kind of logic that you need in order to survive on the African plains. Yes. Um, and so when you're a, when you're a medium-sized object hunting other medium-sized objects and moving at medium speeds, um, then you need a different kind of logic than if, if, if somehow you could imagine that we were shrunk to the quantum lev level, we would have a yeah. different kind of yeah, logic. Yeah, right. Now, you can well imagine that some very forward-thinking one of our remote ancestors who was out there in the savannah and, and actually thinking about quantum mechanics uh, got eaten. Right. So, uh, so, so uh, that's why uh, you know it takes so much dedicated effort for us to figure out these quantum laws because it's not built into our evolutionary structure. It didn't have any survival value. Presumably that's a reasonable way of thinking about it. Yes, I mean, that, that's kind of what I meant, but not quite in, in those terms. Um, I, I mean, I, I'm curious to ask a, an advanced theoretical physicist, which is, I don't often get that opportunity, but, but um, the, the weirdness, the sheer, utter, utter mind-numbing weirdness of quantum theory. Um, do you, are you one of those physicists who, as it were, takes that in your stride and says, well, I don't actually, I can't conceptualize it, but the, the mathematics works, and so I, and, and the predictions that it produces are verified by experiment, and so in some sense it's got to be true. Or do you lie awake at night wishing you could understand, or perhaps you do un feel you understand it at, at, uh, at uh, well, I, I, I don't feel I understand it in the same way that I understand tables and chairs right. in a classical experiential perspective. And I do wish that I had 
quantum mechanical reasoning in my bones. I think I would engage with the universe in a, in a radically different and quite wonderful way. I mean, look, we all know if I, you know, I won't do it, but if I took this and I tossed it to you, you'd put out your hand and you'd catch it, which is an amazing thing because you didn't do the Newtonian calculation of the trajectory yeah, of the bottle. Yeah, you just yeah. sort of felt it in your bones and you yes. put your hand there and you catch yeah. it. So it's so mundane, but it's so wondrous that we're able to do it and it just shows the power of imbibing the rules that are relevant on the scale at which survival takes place. And I wish I had that same quality when it came to uh, an electron in the hydrogen atom, that I could just sort of feel the S orbital, and I could feel, you know, the P orbital, like be in my bones, right? So if you ask me some question about the hydrogen atom, I wouldn't have to go calculate. I would just sort of be able to do what you did when you put out your arm and catch the bottle. So, so I don't have that. I wish that I did. At the same time, I certainly do use the mathematics to gain a confidence with the ideas. You ask me a question and it doesn't, you know, send me scurrying for cover because I'm like, okay, I don't know really fully how to think about that, but I know how to set it up. I know how to solve the equation. I know how to interpret the mathematics because it's been going on for 80, 90 years. And that gives me at least some semblance that I know what's going on. But it isn't in the same intuitive, deep right. intuitive way. And that, that is a, a strange way to live, right? You live, you know, as a physicist, you know, your career, whatever, 30, 40, 50 years. And most of the time, you kind of don't really know what's going on. I mean, do, do your colleagues, um, do, do any of your colleagues claim to have built into their bones, so to speak? Or do they all accept pretty much what you've said? You know, um... I don't know that I've ever heard anybody really say that. Well, actually, no, there is one. He came over to dinner. Uh, my wife is here somewhere. Trace, remember Andy Strominger came over to our, our apartment, a Harvard physicist, and he was really angry at me for saying what I just said in public. He saw it in some version of this, in some conversation, and he said, you're giving the wrong impression of quantum mechanics. We fully understand it. And I was like, Andy, like, what do you really mean by that? But he, what he meant by that was, we have the equations, we have the math, we do the calculations. Which is just what you said it. anyway. Yeah. Which, yes. So, so I, I don't know that he would say that he has it. I'll have to add, you know, I, yeah. I believe that he did not say that he had that yes. deep intuitive understanding. Yes. But um, most people who think deeply about quantum mechanics um, even say that it's an incomplete subject as currently formulated. We do not know how to go from the fuzzy probabilistic mixtures of the reality that the math is telling us about. The electron is 50% here and 50% there and is in some sort of fuzzy mixture of the two. But yet when we measure the position of the electron, we always find it here, we always find it there. So somehow a transition happens from the fuzzy probabilistic reality to the single definite reality of common experience. And we don't have an equation for that. We just say, it happens. Or I should say, people have proposed equations for it, but we have no idea if they're right. Well, Schrodinger ridiculed the, um, uh, the Copenhagen interpretation with his cat, the f famous cat yeah, thought, right. thought experiment. Um, and um, I'm aware that um, there are others who talk about uh, the many worlds interpretation, yeah. who will say it in, in, in terms of Schrodinger's cat, there are there are worlds in which the cat is alive and there are other worlds in which the cat is dead. That, that seems to me to be, although a hideously unparsimonious way of looking at things, yeah. nevertheless, I can, it, it's not totally ridiculous the way the Copenhagen interpretation... Right, yeah, is. so the, just quickly, so the Copenhagen yeah, interpretation sorry, just think. says, hey, uh, we don't understand the process, but here's an algorithm, here's a procedure. Follow the procedure, or as it's usually described, shut up and calculate, right? That's the, uh, the summary of the Copenhagen approach. But that's not a, that's not a theory of physics, right? That, that's a set of instructions. But I, I thought in terms of the, of the cat yeah. satire, so to speak, yeah. the Copenhagen interpretation would say the cat is neither alive nor dead until you open the box. Which, uh, yes, so that, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. The algorithm is open the box, yes. and at that moment, one of the two happens. Yes. How does it happen? I don't know. But it happens. We see it happen. Now, that's a little bit of a, a cartoon description. There have been more refined versions of this story called decoherence that have been developed over the decades. So it's not like it's stagnant, but it's not really 
of theory. It's no, just a set of rules. But let me just quickly add yeah, yeah, yeah. the one point that you did make about the, the many worlds yeah. being unparsimonious. And um, you really need to bring the right barometer, the, the right the yardstick. Many, many worlds would be that there are lots of worlds in which the cat is alive and other worlds in which the cat is dead. And it's, it's that, that, that's right. So the many worlds basically says if quantum mechanics says that this can happen and this can happen and that can happen with some probabilities, then actually all three do happen. They all happen in their own separate world. Yes. So every outcome allowed by quantum physics takes place. Now that sounds incredibly uneconomical, yeah. right? The world is just becoming, the landscape of reality is becoming larger and larger with all these distinct realities allowed by the unfolding of quantum mechanics. But here's the point. It is the most parsimonious theory when you look at the mathematics. Yes. So the equation is pristine and sharp and if you stare at that equation long enough, this is where the equation takes your thinking. If you just literally look at the symbols and say, what are those symbols telling me? Whereas all the other approaches add in other equations, other ideas, okay. baggage, and that sort. So if you use the art stick of the number of universes, out of control. Okay. If you use the art stick of the mathematics, it is as simple as it can possibly be. Wow, I like that. It's very really good. Um, by the way, have you seen, there was a lovely New Yorker cartoon of a, a vet's uh, waiting room and the people were standing around with their dogs and cats and things. And the, uh, the, the nurse is com coming out and talking to a, a gentleman sitting there and saying, about your cat, Mr. Schrodinger, I have some good news and some bad news. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's very nice. So, so... So I'm glad you asked about quantum mechanics because it does give a sense of how our intuition can completely mislead us. The things that our intuition tells us are true or false may not even be describable in that language. In the quantum world, it could be a mixture of both. And that is a fundamental layer of reality that our way of thinking about the world is not tuned into, not tapped into. If you're a trained quantum physicist, you can work it out, as we're describing, but intuitively, it's just sort of not there. So I, I guess uh, the question that comes from that, sort of relevant to other things that, that you, you're, you famously talk about, um, what, what does that tell you about the nature of, of truth? I mean, I mean you spend a, a lot of time, important time, going out into the world as an advocate for, for truth, and we all know what that means in sort of everyday scales, but if we can be a little bit more expansive in our thinking here, um, does this disjuncture between the truth at the level of fundamental physics and the truth at the level of intuition, excuse me for that spittle that just went halfway across the stage, um, does, does that dis distinction give you any pause? Well, we came into this by talking about um if, if, if Martians had a different kind of... Yeah. I mean, to what extent is our conception of logic and truth governed by, the, 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 by what's necessary in order to survive on this planet? And if for some reason you need a different kind of logic to survive in Mars or, or Alpha Centauri or somewhere, would we have a different conception of truth? Um, I, it's a dangerous time to be talking about this with fake truth and post-truth. Yeah. Everything. Um, I... I, I think of myself as a, as a naive realist. I mean, I, I think there is such a thing as truth. Um, but quantum weirdness does worry me. And, and, but um, I, I'd like to think that although um, our view of the world is no doubt shaped by the need to survive in, as I said, in, in, in Africa, hunting buffaloes and things, um, I think I want to say there is such a thing as objective truth. I mean, I, 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 I hate the idea that which we hear from some academic circles that, I don't know, truth is a social construct and, yeah. that, and that, that there's no... Well, well I, I, obviously I would agree that when it comes to the fact of the matter about the electron's um, magnetic dipole moment, right, that's a number that quantum mechanics predicts. We go out and measure it, they agree, digit by digit by digit, nine, ten digits down the road, and that does feel like it qualifies as truth in, in some way, or, or close, extremely close approximation of truth. 
But when we go to sort of higher levels, I guess I feel worried about scientists going out into the world. And, and, and you're right, it's a very curious time because, you know, we're meant to be out there proclaiming the facts about the world and the facts about the matter and the truth of the world. But with my experience in realms that are so different from the truth that we normally talk about in everyday life, it gives me some pause. Mm -hmm. um, can you make me feel better about that a little bit? No, because I, I, I live in a, in a more naive, I mean, I live in, in, a, in a, sim, a simpler world and um, uh, ob objective truth is, is something that that, that we all live live within our everyday lives, and that and that's the that's the world in which we evolved, and and so I, I I don't have that difficulty. I'm just kind of aware. I mean, I have difficulty not just in the quantum field. In, I mean, there are other parts of physics which upset me as well. Um, well, well, in in cosmology. I'm happy to help if I can. Cosmology, for example. Um, yes. I, um, uh, I I I read that. The Big Bang, it, the, the, that at the moment of the, of the Big Bang, everything was compressed, not just into a small volume, but into an infinitely small volume. Like, I, I mean, that worries me. I, got, I, got, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I can, I'm, I'm, I'm aware that a solid object like a table or a rock is mostly empty space, but nevertheless, yeah. if you were to compress it and get rid of all the space between nuclei, yeah. It would not just be the size of a proton. I mean, it would, be, it would still be a fairly substantial chunk yeah, in fact, of you can stuff. Calculate. I want to say this small calculation that if you were to um, take every person that's ever lived yes. on planet Earth and remove the space between the electron and the nucleus and yep. all of their yep. atoms, then the remaining particles without yeah. that space would fit inside of a baseball. But a baseball is a pretty big pretty thing. Big thing. Yeah. No, that's my point. I, I'm, I'm, I'm agreeing with I you. Mean, it, that, that, that is an astonishing calculation, by the way. Um, yeah. I mean, that, 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 it, it, it really is. Um, is that really right? It's really right, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and I have the baseball right here to prove it. No, um, uh, yeah. Uh, but, but, okay. but, uh, but actually, I'm agreeing with you. I'm, I'm, yes. uh, you know, yes. and, and, and so we have exactly the same worry that um, our equations, Einstein's general theory of relativity, are, are the equations that we use here. Those equations actually break down at time zero. Time zero is when everything would be crushed to yes. this infinitesimally small size, and the equations themselves break down, which means that we don't really know what's happening at time zero, which is why, for instance, we've developed ideas that have tried to go beyond Einstein's equations really to answer that very question. That question can be viewed as the motivation for a theory like string theory, or other attempts to put quantum mechanics and gravity together to try to resolve that puzzle. We've not yet resolved it yet, but I will say one thing that is often misunderstood. So today, we don't know whether the universe is um, finite or infinite, right? And in fact, Einstein once family said there are only two things that might be infinite, space and human stupidity. Yes. <laughs> and he said he wasn't sure about space, you know. Uh, and, 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 there, and we're still not sure about space. But if space does go on infinitely far, then as you go further and further back, yes, it, it shrinks. But, you know, if you take infinity and you divide it by two, what do you get? Infinity. Take infinity and divide it by ten, what do you get? Infinity. Mm -hmm. So things in the universe get closer and closer together, but the grand expanse of reality at time zero at the Big Bang would not be infinitesimal. It would be infinitely big, but it would have infinite density. So the idea of a little tiny dot from which the entire, not the observable universe, but the entire universe yeah. emerges, that's, that could well be the wrong picture. Well, but I don't know why you make it so difficult for yourself, because you... <laughs> um, well, in, in, in the following sense. Um, uh, uh, Hubble's law, and you and you you, you reverse the process. Yes. It? I mean, yes. I can see you know you cr crunch it down to something a bit bigger than a baseball. Yeah. Why go to something infinitely small? Good, good. You you could you could imagine running the film in reverse, the cosmic film yeah. in reverse, and you simply stop it a couple frames before time zero. You say let you know, let's just stop it right here and we'll go forward in our explanations yeah. from that starting point. Um, 
we're really goddamn ambitious as physicists, right? We want to go, oh, you know, we really want to go to time zero. We really, you know, and so it will feel to us as though we have left out the essential quality of cosmology. If we have to sort of by hand say, oh, stop the film, we don't no, know what's going on, and go further but, but, from but, there. But why when you get to time zero, does it have to be infinitely small? Why, why shouldn't it be it may not, good. the, the, it, the it, size it, of, a, of a cannonball? Or, I mean, a, a, if our mathematics told us that, then indeed. Oh, it, so, so the mathematics yeah, tells yeah, so, you. So maybe I didn't say it clearly before, but in Einstein's general theory of relativity, when you metaphorically wind yeah. the cosmic film further and further back, imagine the universe is finite in size, so we don't yeah. have to worry about okay, the infinity, yeah, yeah. then indeed it goes right down to zero size. The radius of the universe goes right down to zero. And if somehow you could correct Einstein's equations, which we hope maybe string theory will do, so that with the correction, when you wind the film back to zero, the universe does not have zero size, but it's a little tiny nugget, like a, a baseball or mm. you know, some smaller entity, then that would be a very satisfying cosmology to start from that, yes. from that point forward. But the forward. mathematics doesn't let you. Okay, that, well, I, we've come to string theory now, so... so um, I, 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 mean, I, I often hear the criticism that string, string theory is devoid of um, evidence. And um, really? so, Mr. String Theory, um, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I, 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 I've heard that too. Uh, <laughs> taking the taxi down to dinner, the taxi guy was <laughs> all about string theory, no evidence, what are you guys doing? <laughs> you know, rational science reason. You know, I just sort of cowered in the back and paid my bill and left. But, um, so, so what's the real, the real situation is the following. So we have a real issue on our hands, a theoretical issue, of putting gravity and quantum mechanics into one consistent theoretical structure. Einstein's general theory of relativity does a fantastic job for gravity, makes predictions, and they're confirmed to high accuracy. Same for quantum mechanics as applied to the small domain. The problem is you try to put these two theories together and each claims that the other is wrong. They shoot each other in the foot and it doesn't work. So, right there you see that you've got to make progress of making these theories harmonious because they both are at work in the universe and the universe makes sense, so the mathematics has to make sense. Now, we have finally, Einstein is in some sense looking for this theory, but he wasn't really thinking about it in quantum terms, but the unified theory is what he pursued for 30 years. So we have this unified theory in hand, and then the question is how do you know whether it's right or whether it's wrong. And now we come to the issue of, of predictions and evidence. And here's the thing. We can use the mathematics to make predictions. The predictions, unfortunately, are extraordinarily difficult for us to test. If we had a sufficiently large particle collider, then the collision of particles within the context of string theory would make a prediction that that collider could test. Now, how big would that collider need to be? Well, people have done estimates and it would probably need to be the size of the galaxy. <laughs> now here's the thing. The cost of an accelerator goes like the square of its energy and if you're talking about a collider of that size, it, it's yes. hard to get funding. You know? so, um, <laughs> so that's what it all comes down to. But, but my point is a serious one. Yeah, I get if it. this theory was not able to yeah. make contact with reality, yes. Do you really think physicists would, 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 would spend time on it? I mean, we, you know, we most, I think, we go around once, and I don't want to waste my time on something that, that has no chance of ever making contact with reality, but um, it's hard. Now, in, in lieu of being able to build a collider the size of the galaxy, you try to find indirect tests, clever tests, that might somehow be extracted from the theory, and we had hoped one such test would be uh, confirmed at the Large Hadron Collider, which is a collection of particles that naturally come out of string theory. They're called supersymmetric particles. The name doesn't really matter. But these are particles that no one has ever seen. And the hope was that the Large Hadron Collider slammed protons against protons. You'd produce these particles in the debris, and that would be a nice piece of circumstantial evidence in favor of the theory. The fact of the matter is those particles have not yet been produced. They may be produced shortly, which would be a triumph circumstantial, but still a triumph for these ideas, or it could be that the machine is just not sufficiently energetic to produce mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. So it's not so much that the theory doesn't make any predictions, it's that it's very 
hard to test a theory, and this will be true of any approach to put gravity and quantum mechanics together because, yeah, I, I see you over there. I, I'm, just, I'm ignoring you, but I see you. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, it's a, you know. Uh, you know, it is going to be true of any approach to unify I mean, gravity I, I, and quantum I get that completely. But it, it, it's, it, it's one thing to say um, it is in, in principle meaningless because there is no test. Yes. But to say that it is testable, but not in practice, not, it, not, not, not feasibly whether un, under existing... Yeah, and I think that's a, a, a fundamental distinction that gets lost. And I think it's a vital one. Well, yes. And it's, well, it's silly to lose that distinction. It's a perfect, perfectly good distinction. Yeah. Um, so, so can I go back to, to, to one line of discussion that we were pursuing a little bit before um, yes. the, the physics? Because I, um, I still have the following question, which is, um, so, so uh, do, do you mind if we talk about God for half a second? I made a joke at the front, but do you mind if we talk? Okay, are, you, yeah. are you just so tired of talking about that? Yeah, that, fine, fine. That's all right with you. Good, okay. You know, because we've had a conversation uh, on, on occasion on this subject, and there's a lot we agree on, but there's some stuff that we don't agree on. And, and just as I, I feel like we made progress on string theory and evidence right now, I'd, I'd love it if, if, if like you could convince me to, to see the world differently. I would love to leave tonight. That would be a, a wonderful outcome of this evening. And if, if I could do the same for you, well, I'm not gonna succeed, but you know, that, that would be a, a wonderful goal too. So here's my question. Um, I, 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 I hear you say that you would, you would like to, and, and stop me if I'm saying things imprecisely, that um, you would like to rid the world of religion. Is that, is that too strong? Uh, that's not too strong. Okay, good, all right, good, all right, all right, good. And, and so when you say that, here's my question. Um, uh, are you saying that the structure and the history of religion is something that you just want to get rid of? Or are you saying that you want to get rid of what some people do in the name of religion? Do you make that distinction? Uh, is that one that's relevant? I certainly want to get rid of... Well, um, I, I, I see virtue in the effect that religion has had on human culture. I mean, I see virtue in music and, and art and, and things like that. Um, I... But if we think of religion as providing an alternative idea for how the universe came into existence, how life came into existence, that kind of thing, then um, as a scientist, I want to get rid of it. Um, so, um, I mean... Which I agree with. Okay. Well, what part do you not want to get rid of? Yeah, then? good. <laughs> so, so um, well, let me just give you a an example, and you okay. tell me where you come down on it. Okay. Maybe that's the most okay, straightforward good. way of doing it. So, um, you know, in, in Jewish, I'm Jewish, um, uh, maybe a few others in, in the audience. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, and um, so, so, not all, of course, but, but many Jews here in New York view their religion in the following way. They're willing to cherry pick it for the parts that enrich their lives. They're willing to throw away the parts that are archaic and just have no place, you know, in, 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 in the modern world. Um, they're willing to view it as um, almost poetry, almost as, as fiction literature, with the one difference being that it connects them to a long lineage that makes them feel part of a larger narrative. Is there something that you don't like about what I oh, just said? Oh, I get that totally. I mean, I, I have no problem with that. No problem with that. No, no. Uh, I, because, um, I mean, you, you, you have a heritage, you have ancestors, you, yeah. have, you have literature, you have... I mean, that... It, it's the same as I feel, uh, you, no doubt you feel too, um, a, a connection with Shakespeare. I yeah, mean, right. You know, it, it, I, I don't have any problem with, with, with saying um, I have a... Christian heritage, Jewish heritage. In the case of a Jewish heritage, you have an even stronger reason, which is the persecution of Jews, right. um, which has happened through the centuries, and perhaps most notably in the 20th century, but early centuries too. Um, this is a very powerful reason for a kind of loyalty to a, um, a tradition. Um, where I part company with it, as you do, is in... in 
where it makes claims about the universe and and um, the, the the nature of life and yeah that kind so, of so thing. when you when you say just for my own clarity when you say that you when you agreed and everyone sort of cheered which is sort of fun uh, that you wanted to rid the world of religion I wouldn't have thought that this would then be your reaction to my description well I I, I suppose by religion I meant the scientific um, falsehood of, yeah. of, um, of, of of religion. I did not. I did not mean tradition because because um, there are this Jewish tradition. There are all sorts of other traditions and tradition in lit literature, tradition in art. Right. Um, I don't want to get rid of that. So then I wonder about about the following. So religion as a um, you know as a word, you know, few hundred, five hundred years old or so. It's not one that really goes back to uh, archaic times. So, um, and, and there are some who f have thought through the history of religious development and have indicated that the use of religion in the ways that you find utterly unacceptable is relatively recent, a relatively recent development. So, if you take this structure that, you know, go back a handful of thousand years, wherever you sort of want to, you know, uh, view its origins, you know, uh, 1,500, 2,000 BC, something of that sort, let's just say, um, uh, does it not feel that you're focusing um, um, so intently on the last part of the development of that structure in a way that, at least as I've heard it, and it's different from hearing it tonight, which is very interesting for me, wipes it all out by virtue of what's happening now. I'm skeptical of the suggestion that uh, the scientific falsehood part of religion is recent. The, I'm sorry, what? That the, that the scientific falsehood part of religion is recent. Um, I, I, I've, I'm, I'm aware that there are people who say that. Yeah. Um, and I, I think they're wrong. I mean, I, I just think if you, if you go back to... Uh, the Old Testament, it's just, it would just be nonsense to say that the, that the characters in the Abraham and, and, and um, David and, and um, Moses and people um, were not interested in the um, scientific, quasi-scientific aspects of it. Of course they were. I mean, they were, they were obsessed with it. They, were, they, were, um, um, they believed that there was a, an, a, a person called Yahweh um, who made the world and who actually intervened the whole time, um, who, who, who um, wrought miracles and things like that. Um, I think it's Karen Armstrong who's, who's made, the, made the case that, 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 that the scientific part is recent. I, I just, just think that's not historically accurate. So, but if one takes this metaphorical approach, as I was sort of describing it in yeah. that particular case, um, um, uh, well, let me actually frame it somewhat differently. So, so um, to what extent are, uh, are, are you okay with, uh, I don't know how else to say it, but irrational ideas? Can I just give you an example again? You know, um, uh, I don't know, about three weeks ago, you know, I, I live uptown, and uh, you know, my, my mother lives over here, 81st Street. Uh, she's, you know, in her 90s. And I, and, I, and I called, she's always home, she doesn't really go out without me. I called, you know, the answer machine picked up, she didn't answer. I called again, she didn't answer. I'm starting to like really freak out. So I, I get in the taxi cab and I'm racing down to 81st Street and I'm telling you, in that taxi cab, I was praying to God that she would be okay. And I'm praying to God and I know that there, I do not think there is a God, okay? This is a totally irrational thing that I'm doing. Let me just quickly say, if you're there, I'm sorry, all right? If you're, you know, I just got to hedge my bets, you know? It's a conversation here. I'm just sort of saying how I feel. Uh, so, so, uh, but I'm like really uh, uh, praying, and, 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 and when I got there and everything ultimately was fine, um, it, it, it felt like, you know, a, a small miracle to me. Now, I don't believe in miracles. I believe that we're all bags of particles governed by the laws of physics, and there's nothing else besides that. But at the same time, I find it useful to hold these irrational ideas in mind at certain moments, and I don't give a shit that I do. Yeah, um, I get that. I, mean, I, I think I, I, I'll, I'll make a similar con confession. Um, I, would, I would hesitate 
to spend the night in a notoriously haunted house. I'm the faintest. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, this is a good night, man. Uh, that but, is so. But but I mean, we are both being irrational, and yeah. and um, uh, and 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 that is a sin. I agree. Okay. All right, I'm being waved at to open the discussion for audience questions. I can't see who's out there. I don't know who has a microphone, but whoever does. We need does, the lights up. To... Can we have the lights up, please, in, in the auditorium? That's not in not, the not so much on us. Yeah, yeah good, yeah. perfect. That's not perfect. It's, it's... Oh, is it in your eyes? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can we just about dimly see people now? Yeah, whoever has a mic, just, just jump right in. Good evening, and thank you for a wonderful, wonderful night. I guess my question is, how do you dovetail rationality into the social and political dialogue that's going on in the, not just the United States, but in the world today? How do you, how do you combat irrationality with rationality at an emotional level? Such that okay. it's kind yeah, of yeah, so the, the question is, yeah, yeah. How did, yeah, did you hear it? I yeah. did, I did yeah. hear it. I was hoping you'd answer it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I can take a crack and then you can sort of, you know, back well, clean up and, and finish it up well, for me. I, I mean, we, we, we live in a time when rationality and truth are not respected in, in, in corridors of power. Um, and um, how do you reconcile? Well, you don't reconcile them. What you do is you get out and vote the bugger out. <laughs> But I would add one, 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 one quick thing on that. Um, it's, 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 it's virtually impossible, i found, to have a conversation with somebody who's not going to f play by the same rules. And, and, and so it's virtually impossible to use rationality to convince someone who's looking at the world and describing things in an irrational manner. And I, I, you know, I think we once discussed this, if I'm not mistaken, but I saw a video of yours once when you had a long conversation with, with a woman and trying to convince her about the, um, the you know, archaeological record, yeah. right? And, and I sat there and I, and I felt for you because I have had those conversations with people about, you know, the Big Bang and things of that sort. But it was clear that you were never going to make headway in that conversation. So, so you stayed with it, which is great, but that approach probably is ineffective, yeah, right? Yeah, she was, she was a hopeless case. <coughs> um, <coughs> I, know, I know who you mean. Her, her name is Wendy Wright. Uh, and um, she, she, was, she clearly was not listening. And, and you're right, it was a totally lost cause. But remember, this was a television program. So although I was talking to her, right. it's irrelevant whether I could convince her. I, I clearly couldn't. But there would have been lots of people watching that television program. That's true. Yeah. Who, who would have been um, influenced by it and recognizing um, that, that she was being completely irrational. And so um, I, 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 I don't buy the argument of it, which I've heard often, that because you cannot convince the idiot you're talking to, um, that means that you should, should simply um, give up. I mean, right, um, right. Yeah, I guess the quick question, but we have others. Uh, it, it, would there be another strategy? And I don't know what the answer to that question is. Uh, and there are one or two questions uh, from the audience still. So I think you're, you're, you're sad. Sure. So uh, going back to the idea of string theory, when you guys were talking about how to actually combine the two uh, formats of math, I guess. Yes. When we, since we, we are the ones that actually created math to begin with, is it possible that what we use is fundamentally flawed to describe what you're attempting to do? Totally. It's totally possible. I mean, I have, I've, I've, I've had, you know, thoughts, I don't know, nightmares, that when we have these conversations with the alien intelligence that we ultimately talk to, you know, they'll come down and say, show us, guys, what have you done? And figuring out the universe, and we pull out general relativity, quantum mechanics, we open it up, and they just sort of look, math. We tried that. You know, it takes you part of the way, but no, no, you'll never get anywhere with mathematics, you know. Um, 
And, and, and the problem is, when I then try to imagine what it is that they would substitute for mathematics, I don't have the creative imagination to think of anything that isn't ultimately isomorphic to math. Math just with some different formulation that we could map onto mathematics that we currently use. So, yes, it could be that we have a limited set of tools based on the limited thing inside of our head that's taken us so far, but maybe it will not take us to the end. Thank you. So when I end up having discussions about science and religion to a surprisingly frequent uh, extent, I end up encountering the viewpoint that science and religion are actually one and the same thought process, that science is a form of religion uh, in one way or another. And I try to debate that in a number of ways, but I would be interested to hear what you would have to say to someone who says, well, science really isn't any different from religion in the first place. Well, I'll give a real quick one, and maybe Richard will follow up. You know, uh, there are similarities, there are radical differences, and the most radical of all is, uh, show me how to use any religious text. I don't care, pick anyone that you want. Show me how to use that to calculate the spectrum of helium. <laughs> right? So, so there are qualities of the world that we understand rigorously by virtue of the scientific structure. It is mathematics that makes predictions that we can go out and test. And moreover, if we test a prediction and it's wrong, we throw the thing away because we are incrementally moving toward truth. And that, that, that's quite different. And, and let me just quickly also add to that, just so you know that I'm not just spouting hot air. I really will put, you know, my money where my mouth is. I would be thrilled if tomorrow string theory was ruled out. I've worked on it since 1985, okay? I had, I had black hair when I started, okay? Um, but um, I'm not invested in it. I'm invested in truth or getting closer to truth. And this is the way that we can move toward truth. I, I have nothing to add to that. I mean, I, I think it's absolutely right. And, and um, there's a huge difference. There's, and the difference is evidence in massive, massive, massive quantities of evidence. And in the case of religion, there is absolutely none whatsoever. Uh, given the, um, the singularity at the beginning of the universe, the Big Bang, and the, uh, the evidence that, qu that particles are entangled, Yes that uh, if that implies that all particles are thereby entangled with each other, does that intuitively have any implications for consciousness theory? Um, it, it, it's a good question. Uh, since we don't really understand consciousness as we were describing here, it's a little hard for me to give you a complete answer to that. But I will say the following. It is the case that when particles interact with each other, they do acquire this very strange quantum mechanical quality called entanglement. Einstein, again, was a key figure in figuring out entanglement. As you no doubt know, but just so that we're all clear, if two particles are entangled, one could be over here, one could be over here, they could be on opposite sides of the country, opposite sides of the universe. You measure this particle and somehow it instantaneously affects the particle over there. That's weird, right? Einstein called it spooky, spooky action at a distance, right? Now, when you have all these particles interacting near the Big Bang, they do all become entangled, but the thing is, the greater the number of particles, the more dilute the entanglement becomes. And it can be diluted to such a degree that to some extent it doesn't really play the kind of fundamental role that it would with just two particles in a pristine environment that you set up to be maximally entangled. So while, in some sense, everything is connected to everything else, and maybe you want to think that consciousness, therefore, is sort of connected to the world through some quantum entanglement with our brains, the degree of entanglement is just so fantastically tiny that it's hard to imagine that that's how things will turn out. Richard, anything? Obviously not. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm just fascinated. <laughs> Thank you very much for both coming out um, and the lively discussion. I, had, I grew up in New York City and I had a Jewish earth science teacher, but you know, and so I didn't have the conflict between religion and science that Mr. Dawkins grows up with. And he just pointed out, if you believe the world was created in six days, how, do we, how long would a day have been by that metaphorical understanding? 
Um, so I was very grateful for my public school education. But my question... <laughs> But, uh, hey, I went to PS 87, I is 44, right down the street, so I'm with you. My question is entangled with the previous one. Uh, <laughs> the double slit experiment in quantum physics implies that an electron will behave as a wave when it is not being observed, but returns to acting like a particle when we try to observe it, judging by the interference pattern it produces. This implies that the universe we live in is conscious, Without personifying this intelligence, would you agree, Mr. Dawkins, that quantum physics implies that our universe is conscious? No. I mean, uh, um, Thank the, you. The, uh, of course it doesn't imply that. It's nothing to do, nothing to do with it. It's, it's deeply mysterious, but there are, there are different ways of being mysterious. Just because they're, but they're both mysterious, it doesn't mean they're the same thing. Yeah. There can be a, um, an error in thinking that often tries to imagine that consciousness plays a critical role in causing the fuzziness of the quantum world to resolve into a definite reality, such as in the experiment that, that you uh, described so well. But there's no evidence that consciousness is a vital part of that story. We believe, I mean, there were people in the 30s and 40s who, who put this idea forward. And it's very hard to rule it out, just like it's hard to rule out many things in the world because we always bring consciousness to bear on any data that we look at, that we become aware of, that we can speak of. Consciousness is part of it. You could say, therefore, consciousness was part of ensuring that that reality arose. But as far as we know, it doesn't need to be consciousness that brings a definite reality. It doesn't need a physicist with a PhD. It could, it doesn't, it could be a mouse could do it. It could be a dust moat that could do it. It's any kind of interaction. It could be a photon in the microwave background radiation that bangs into the electron, and that forces it to snap to attention. So I, I don't see any direct role for consciousness, but who knows? We could be wrong. Good evening, gentlemen. Thank you. Uh, one of the tangents we went down tonight was exploring the concept of extraterrestrial life or life outside the galaxy. So from Richard's point of view, you said we're a sample size of one. So all our concepts of what one may be is what we see before us, regardless of our imagination. And when you look at Hollywood and you look at aliens, they're sort of humanoid. And I kind of, my thinking is any superior race has to be sort of like us because we got to be able to make I can't see something with tentacles making a watch. So are we limited to what, are you limited to what you believe a race may be outside of our existence because we're human and you, you, we have no other concept to measure against? Science fiction writers are often criticized for lack of imagination and, and uh making them sort of humanoid, but with three eyes, or you know, some minor difference like that. There are biologists, uh, Simon Conway Morris, Cambridge University is one, who actually thinks that um, the likelihood is that life would produce humanoids. Uh, and and um, he goes, I think, too far. But he does make the point that convergent evolution is very powerful, and we have spectacular examples in the animal kingdom of different radically unrelated animals converging on the same uh, design, because that's a very good way to be. Uh, and uh, um, you're probably familiar with, well, for example, Australian uh, mammals, the marsupial fauna of Australia, produced a range of mammals which were um, niche for niche, convergent upon the mammals in, in Asia and in, independently in South America. Um, so he, he deploys the, the power of convergent evolution to suggest that if there is life elsewhere in the universe, quite probably it will look pretty much like us. Um, I don't think I go along with that quite, but, but the point has been made. Um, we talked a bit earlier about uh, different kinds of life, whether it has to be carbon-based, that kind of thing. And um, I think it's an open question, and I think we can get a sort of handle on the question by looking at the animal kingdom and looking at the, the different things that have evolved in the animal kingdom, both divergent and convergent. 
Um, but I think it's an open question, and I would, as I said before, I would love that. I would love to come across a second sample of of, a, of life. I'll look around outside the parking lot. <laughs> yeah, I didn't hear that. I didn't hear it either, but it was definitely funny. <laughs> Hi. Uh, you guys have talked a lot about T0, what happened after that. I don't think there's been a lot of talk about what happened, or not what happened, at, at T0, what, what happened at T0, what created it, isn't that? And the universe happened four and a half, well, 14 billion years later, we have life, so everything was so precise. Does that imply some kind of God, watchmaker, something? I mean, could you delve into more what you think about what happened before that incident at the Big Bang, not everything after? Well, I'll start with the Big Bang, and then Richard maybe take it in, in, into the biological domain. But uh, the, the, the question you're asking is, why is there something rather than nothing? And it is the key question, and it's one that we really have absolutely no idea how to answer. And I think we're all upfront about that. But once we allow for stuff to exist, space, time, matter, in some sense, the laws of physics, with that minimal architecture, we can then run things forward. And as far as we know, we don't need anybody from the outside tinkering with things in order to get things where they currently are. So could you say that some god created it and then stood back? Of course, and this has long been said, and there's very little that we can ever say to refute that. The point of the matter, though, is it's not very interesting. It may be true, it ain't interesting. Why? Because you're just replacing one mysterious collection of words with another word, which to me holds as much mystery. So from the standpoint of explaining science, I don't find that it takes us anywhere forward. From the standpoint of understanding the rich structure of, of human heritage, and our ongoing attempt to figure out who we are and how we fit into the cosmos, I do find there's a lot of value in that way of thinking about the world, but I don't find any value in terms of trying to find scientific explanatory power. I think it's worse than that. I think it's worse than, than um, just not interesting um, because the, the point is that um, although it's very difficult to know what happened at the, in, at the, at the beginning uh, and where the laws of physics come from, where the physical constants come from, what we can say is that it is relatively easier to understand how simple things came into existence than complex things. And um, a god who thought it all up and created it, even a deistic god who didn't uh, subsequently intervene, Whatever else he, she, or it w w was, was like, they could not be simple. I mean, if, they're going to be, if we're going to credit them with the brain power to devise the laws of physics and to, devise, and to set the physical constants to some optimal value, then they've got to be the kind of entity that requires explanation in its own right, of exactly the same kind of explanation as we in biology are used to providing in the theory of evolution. So it would have to be intelligent, in other words. And intelligence, intelligence, creativity, uh, inventiveness, qualities like that come late in the universe. We understand where they come from. They come from evolutionary processes. To suddenly smuggle in intelligence at the, at the very beginning is to betray the entire scientific enterprise. So it's much worse than being uninteresting. It's positively anti-scientific. So, so the one thing I would say is, um, uh, well, since you got applause, I'll, I'll sort of agree with you. But, um, <laughs> you, you know, um, you know my, my, my suspicion, or at least I raise it as a possibility, the judgment of the complexity and intelligence required to give rise to the universe as we know it, I feel like you're coming at it from what we currently understand, which could well be completely misleading. There may be this incredibly simple starting point that a divine being could have invoked, and all of this might, by virtue of some deep symmetry in the structure that isn't even apparent, it's all simple, from the standpoint of the ingredients and, and the laws, and it may be the... So, so I guess I slightly worry, even though I, I largely agree with you, I slightly worry about saying what would be required, because we don't know what would be required. 
that's what I mean by no. us not being able to figure it out. But if it's simple, why call it God? I mean, I, I, no, no, I agree. That's exactly the point that I made. It would be just replacing one word with another. But I guess I worry about the argument of trying to uh, delineate the degree of intelligence and complexity required. Uh, I have no idea whether what you said is true in that regard. But if it's just plain simplicity, just call it simplicity. What, the, the, what? Yeah, so, 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 so that, I, uh, that I agree with, but it was the uh, attributing a certain necessary level of complexity and intelligence that, that uh, I, I find hard. But, but I agree with the, the larger point that we're just replacing one word with another. So you see I'm unsatisfied with that. <laughs> I should have stopped when I convinced him of string theory. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Uh, yeah, if I was listening carefully enough earlier, uh, I think it was said that uh, the whole range of physics from quantum mechanics to general relativity, you could understand the machine of the brain, but not consciousness. And two things occur to me about physics that aren't understood, and I'm wondering if you have any comment as whether consciousness might be fueled by dark energy or by the collapse of Schrodinger's multiplicity into the actual measurable yeah. singular. So for dark energy, I, it's hard for me to see where there'd be any connection. You know, the amount of energy in dark energy is so feeble in any volume compatible with everyday experience that it's hard for me to imagine that energy making a significant difference. But when you come to uh, the collapse of the wave function, the Schrodinger equation that you described, there are some very smart people who do draw a connection to consciousness, right? Roger Penrose is a very smart man. He was my graduate advisor at Oxford for two weeks. Uh, and, um, and, and, uh, and he is convinced by virtue of uh, analysis that he's done for a decade and experiments that he's done with neuroscientists that there is a connection between microtubules in the brain that can collapse the wave function and he believes that that's the seat of consciousness. I've looked at it. I'm not, I, don't, I don't see it. I'm not convinced of it, but I can't say that I've studied it in great detail. So, so is that a possible link? I, I guess it, it conceivably could be. Thank you. I don't know if you... I've tried to read Roger's book, but, uh, but um, I, I must say I didn't... I, I, I don't understand quantum theory enough to... Right, right. <clears throat> Hi, so my question... Um, it's a fun question that I thought of because we were talking about a little bit um, how Lord Kelvin, though a really brilliant scientist was astoundingly wrong about certain things about the universe and <coughs> Earth. And so I wonder if we took two well-known scientists from your respective fields, let's say Einstein and, uh, and uh, Darwin, and we brought them to our time, what do you think that they would be the most astounded and amazed by with our current scientific understanding? And what do you think they would find the hardest to accept or be most skeptical about? Hmm. So, so I can do Einstein <coughs> if you want, or do you want to leave with Darwin? I, I, I once um, had to do a television program in which a Japanese television company uh, brought an actor dressed up as Darwin um, <laughs> to visit me, and uh, I was supposed to bring him up to date as to things that had happened <laughs> since, since his death. Um, and uh, it, it was an interesting experience because he, 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 he was well made up. He had pl plenty of slap on, which kept on dropping off. Um, and um, I, so I sort of bowed very low and said what an honor it was to, to, to meet him and things. And then um, I had to explain to him about modern genetics. And uh, he... Um, Th this would have been very surprising to him, very interesting, not so much surprising as revelatory to him, because in his own lifetime, um, not only did Lord Kelvin's estimate of time worry him, he was also worried by a man called Fleming Jenkin, who um, made the point that uh, because of the prevailing genetics of D Darwin and Jenkins' time, which was blending inheritance. They were aware that, of course, that animals inherit from both parents, but they thought of it as being a kind of mixture of the mother and father, almost like mixing two liquids. Uh, and Fleming Jenkins pointed out that if that were the case, um, uh, offspring should be intermediate between, their two, between the two parents. 
And if that were the case, then there would be a, a rapidly, natural selection would run out of variation on which to select. Um, and this did worry Darwin. He shouldn't really have worried because it was quite obviously not true that um, variation disappears. It's, it's, not, it's not the case that as the generations go by, animals become more and more gray and sort of un uniform. They do retain their, 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 their variation. But nobody understood why. And it wasn't, well, M Mendel, who was a contemporary of Darwin, actually did discover why, but Darwin never knew about it. It wasn't rediscovered un until after Darwin's death. Um, so I had to explain Mendelian genetics to this actor posing as Darwin, and also um, d d DNA. And, and um, he did his part well. He said, yes, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I don't know whether that, I mean, I, I think that is, that is one thing that, that, that would have, as I said, not, not quite surprised Darwin, but, but, but he would have felt, yes, everything clicks into place now. And, and I, I now, that was the one thing that Darwin got wrong. He, did, he got precious little wrong. I mean, if you read The Origin of Species, it is an amazingly prescient book. As Michael Gieselin said, he was working a hundred years ahead of his time. Astonishing man. Um, but the but genetics he did get get wrong, and and so that perhaps the answer. Yeah. So on the, quickly on the Einstein one, I, I think Einstein would be surprised that quantum mechanics is still with us effectively in the form that he detested, um, and he thought that advances would do an end run around quantum mechanics, and somehow all the weirdness would disappear with a deeper understanding, and it hasn't happened. Um, I also think that, you know, as we describe advanced, you know, as we describe string theory and, and, and all the qualities of the theory, and, and I, I think you just say, you guys are geniuses. <laughs> Utter geniuses. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I have a question for Brian regarding mass. Um, I understand from Einstein that a particle's mass increases with acceleration. At CERN, they take protons and accelerate them to very close to the speed of light, over 99.99% over of the speed of light. My question is, what is the change in the mass of that particle from rest to the point of collision? Multiply by 1 over the square root of 1 minus v over c squared, v is the velocity, c is the speed of light. Thank, thank you. Thanks very much. <laughs> I didn't understand that answer at all. <laughs> and so I have to write this, but I'm going to ask, hopefully, for a non-pessimistic answer to this question, which is um, I'm a little puzzled by the disappointment in the search for extraterrestrial intelligent life, because it seems challenging by or severely limited by two elements. One is astrobiology, which seems to suggest that the combustible energy sources that would be, uh, they, they would, they suffocate the species that create sufficient advancement to support radio wave broadcasting. We're suffocating ourselves. And the other element that I find challenging in terms of evidence for extraterrestrial life is the time synchronization needed to collect a radio signal the duration of a species that broadcasting is probably short. Yeah. The universe, when I was growing up, we thought it was expanding. Now you guys have changed the rules again. No, no it's still expanding. But it's accelerating. Yeah, it's accelerating. Ex so in some period of time, we're only going to see our own galaxy. So you've got a dual prong problem of combustible energy suffocating us or others and getting the signals to synchronize. So why would we see Yeah, well, I, I agree. Life? You're pointing out how unlikely these programs are to succeed. I mean, look, life on this planet uh, began very early on in the history of this planet, but uh, in that four billion year window, as you're saying, we've only been radio broadcasting, what, for the last 50, 75 years. So even if an extraterrestrial society, civilization, was trying to find us and they sort of knew where to look, it wouldn't just be a matter of pointing their scopes in the right direction. They'd have to be waiting for just the right interval of time. So, so I, th I think you're pointing out how hard it is and therefore perhaps not surprising that we haven't found any if indeed 
life is commonplace throughout the universe. And the other thing is, look, you know, we, we, we now know of so many planets, right? That's one of the major changes in the last decade, right? There are so many planets out there. And if a, a fraction of them support life, right, there could be whatever. There could be, you know, a, a hundred million civilizations scattered throughout the galaxy, okay? But that's one per, per enormous number of stars. So it's still very sparse, even with a hundred million civilizations out there. So it's hard to find. And what about your take on astrobiology and the likelihood of a species suffocating itself? I'm curious to hear. Well, what uh, yes, and there's a, a, f a further source of, of pessimism would be that the interval of time between a civilization working out how to use, send radio waves and destroying itself by warfare right. of some sort. Yeah. It could be, I mean, there could be civilizations winking into existence here, here and there and then winking out again um, after a rather short time. Uh, I, I guess that's another aspect of your suffocating. Thing. So quickly, we're at 10 o'clock, but I think we start a little bit later. You guys okay to do another five, 10 minutes? Is, is that okay? Okay. Uh, there seems to be a widespread idea in the culture that in order for life to be meaningful, we all eventually have to die. And I'm a little skeptical of that idea. Um, it seems meretricious, like makes us feel better that there has to be some meaning. Um, but if you imagine asking someone 50 years going by in their life, is your life still meaningful? Are you involved in useful projects? Are you advancing things? It seems like life could still be meaningful no matter how old you're getting. So I wonder what your thoughts are about the necessity of death for the meaning of life. I'll let Richard... Uh, well, the, I mean, that. There, there is a, a pretty sound Darwinian reason why, why, why we die, um, which um, I can perhaps briefly explain. Um, genes uh, mature at different... I mean, when I say mature, have, have their effect at various times during life, and most of them have an effect during early embryology, um, but then they have effects later and later and later. Um, and if you imagine a gene that makes you die of, for example, cancer at the age of 10, and then another gene that makes you die at the age of 20, another gene that makes you die at the age of 30, 40, etc. Um, the ones that make you die at the age of 10 are never going to get through into the next generation. The ones that make you die at the age of 20, a few of them will get through. The ones that make you die at the age of 30, quite a lot will get through, etc. And ones that make you die as you, when, you're, when you're 100 will certainly have got through by the time they kill you. Um, so we are um, a kind of dustbin of late-acting lethal genes or sub-lethal sub, sub genes, which is why, from a Darwinian point of view, we die of old age. Um, and there's a more sophisticated version of that theory. But you seem to be... Um, talking rather less in a Darwinian way than in a, than in a sort of subjective way, saying, wouldn't it be nice if we... Wouldn't, wouldn't life feel more meaningful, I think, was the way you put it, um, if we didn't die? No, I, I was challenging the idea that people spread that in order for life to be meaningful, we have to die. Like, people say life wouldn't be meaningful if we lived forever. And that just seems... Well, I don't know who says that. I mean, um, well, like, I, like Bernard Williams says that. I mean, there are philosophers who've, who've thought this issue through and have made cogent arguments that um, all the things that give life meaning that we'd usually list, um, many of them would evaporate if we didn't die. Right? I mean, you know, if um, you know, those of you who, uh, you know, your abilities could always uh, improve over time, well, if you have infinite time, you'll be able to achieve anything. So there'll be no real challenge, there'll be no sense of success. Those of you who your abilities will plateau and hit a limit, well, for eternity, you're going to be stuck. Right? That's not going to feel too good either, right? So, so you know, uh, but, you know, these are nice, interesting thought experiments. Uh, it's hard to really know, but I guess from a flat-footed, straightforward perspective, I just wonder if you had the opportunity, hey, Professor Dawkins, you've done so much for humanity, uh, we're going to let you live forever. W would, you, would, you, would you choose that? No, I, 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 maybe 200 years, but... But, but, um, but at the end of the 200, they came back to you at the end of the 200 and said, you know, your 200's up, uh, hey, you want a couple hundred more? Tell you what, I think the, 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 the only frightening thing about death, really, is it, 
is eternity. And I'd rather spend eternity under a general anaesthetic. <laughs> Which is what's going to happen. All right, so yeah. we, have time for all, we only have time for two more questions. I have a question for both of you. Uh, I'm curious if you think it's possible or even likely that the true nature of reality and physics could be something that's fundamentally just inaccessible to the human mind um, because yeah, the way I, I, our brains I, are wired. No, I, I, you know, I, um, I had a, a NOVA program years ago on a book I wrote. And in one of the scenes, I'm at a blackboard lecturing to somebody who clearly is not getting because I'm getting frustrated. And ultimately, the camera pans and it's a Labrador retriever that I was, that I was you know. And, and it was misunderstood by many people. They thought we were trying to say the audience is like the dog. Uh, but that, that's, that's not what it is. The point was uh, there are intelligent species that walk this planet that seem to have a limit to what they can understand, right? Dogs and cats are smart, but they seem not to understand the general theory of relativity, right? And every time I say that, I always think the dogs are like, <laughs> he thinks we don't understand relativity, a stupid human, you know. Uh, but, but barring that possibility, there are these smart beings that have a limit, why would we be any different from that? That's the point. So exactly like you're saying, it could be the truth is right out here staring us in the face, but we just don't have the brain power to grab hold of it. And maybe we never will. Now, the optimistic way of saying it is, even with this limited brain power, look what we've been able to figure out, right? We can figure out laws that tell us how the universe evolved from a split second after the beginning. We're able to pry apart matter and understand its constituents. We understand how time elapses, how space expands, why stars shine. I mean, that's pretty great stuff. So maybe we have the brain power and it's just a matter of time, but nobody can say for sure. One of my favorite science fiction stories is Fred Hoyle's The Black Cloud. Uh, despite its obnoxious hero, it's probably modeled after the author, I should imagine. I um, but I at the end of the, of the book, um, the, the, the humans are in touch with a superhuman intelligence. And the human, superhuman intelligence, the black cloud, communicates to them its knowledge of physics, and they can't take it. The human brain just burns up, and, and two really smart physicists die as a result of overheating of the brain. Um, and, and so that, that I think is perfectly possible, that we are not capable of it. On the other hand, I agree with Brian. Um, I'm amazed at the fact that a brain which was naturally selected on the African savanna to hunt and gather is capable of devising special general and general relativity, quantum theory, and it's, a, it's astonishing what the human brain can do, given the much more limited tasks which it was required to do when it was being naturally selected. These are emergent properties. It's, it's a, a wonderful testament to the power of emergence. Uh, and so there, there, maybe there isn't a limit, but um, I don't know one way or the other. Thanks. Hello. Uh, do you think that modern physicists are worried enough or spending enough time on uh, realism and ontology? And specifically, what do you think of Bohmian and pilot waves? That is exactly the question I'd hoping we'd end on. <laughs> uh, so, so um, yeah, so uh, it, 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 we just had a, a conference, for instance, at Columbia last week where the focus was uh, uh, philosophers were involved and, and some physicists have sort of described philosophers as having no role in physics. That's utterly ridiculous. These are folks who've thought hard about quantum physics, forcing us to really try to link up the mathematical symbols with real things in the world and to shake those dictionaries and make sure that they really work. And we're uncertain at the moment. So uh, on the ontology side, people do think about it, but it's typically more in the philosophy side of things. And I do think that physicists could do more to advance that, uh, that project. In terms of this Bohmian approach that you mentioned, this is a very interesting story that I'll just tell in 30 seconds. The approach to quantum mechanics that Richard was describing, you know, the Copenhagen approach, that was really in some sense promulgated by some very convincing physicists in the 1920s, 1930s and so forth, Niels Bohr being sort of the famous father of quantum mechanics. Um, if the Bohmian approach had a champion 
of that magnitude and that level of uh, respect, I think it would likely have been the dominant way that we would have thought about quantum mechanics. Why? In the Copenhagen approach, you have to give up making definite predictions. You can only make probabilistic predictions. That's hard to swallow, okay? But you also have to give up particles having definite trajectories. Particles no longer go along trajectories as in the Newtonian picture. In the Bohmian approach, yes, you also have to deal with probabilities, but particles do have definite trajectories. So you only have to sort of give up one thing in the Bohmian framework, and you have to give up two in the Copenhagen one. So I think people would have had an easier time and would have latched on to this way of thinking about things. People still push this theory forward. Whether or not it's actually right in the sense of it's the real description of the world, nobody knows. But it's a worthy contender in an arena where many are still competing to win out with the right way of thinking about quantum mechanics. End with that. Thank you very much. Let's give a big round of applause for Brian Green and Richard Dawkins. Thank you so much. Terrific. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you all for coming, really. It's, uh, again, I, I, I've said this at many events, but it's, it's no less true with this one. It's just amazing to put a date on the calendar and show up in a theater and have all of you come out. It's really it's an immense privilege, and uh, thank you for coming out. <laughs> Lift weights in order to pour your water, Brian. Wow. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so. I think we're going to start, uh, kind of a natural place to start is just to talk about what do we think we know and why we think we know it. Uh, I think, uh, you know, from a, uh, and, and then ultimately why any of that matters, you know, why being right or wrong or close enough matters. Um, for me, it, it, it's, you know, coming from more of a, a life science and philosophy of mind background that the thing that that strikes me as the, the potential hubris of our whole enterprise is that there, there is a, a clear scientific rationale for being skeptical about our powers to know what's going on here. And that's, I mean, if you just take evolution as your starting point, there's no reason why apes like ourselves should know a damn thing about what's going on here, despite the fact that our, that our, our science and, our, and the technology that it spawns is incredibly useful, and we, we seem to be playing a language game with ourselves, one that's augmented by the language of mathematics, that is producing less ignorance and more knowledge. I mean, it seems to be pushing back the frontier of, so, of, of something that is fundamentally bewildering. There's, there's a mystery that we confront. We don't understand why we get sick, and then we discover viruses and bacteria. And I mean, there's, there seems to be progress, right? But it's just... There, there is no reason to expect that the, the intuitions we rely on to do science should be fitted to reality in any deep way. Because if, if we look at our you know, chimpanzee cousins, it's obvious not only do they not know a damn thing about what's going on, they couldn't possibly know a damn thing about what's going on. And we are just a slight iteration beyond them as a matter of you just you know, uh, apes having evolved. So where do you, as a scientist, uh, get your, your confidence that the, the game you play, as, as a physicist in particular, is actually bringing you and other physicists close, in, into closer context, in contact with you? Yeah. Well, I mean, I share certainly a lot of that intuition. In fact, um, you know, I had a, a, a TV show many, many years ago where uh, it was on the first book I wrote, and there was one scene where I'm at a blackboard lecturing on the general theory of relativity, and clearly I'm lecturing to a student that's not quite getting it, and the camera slowly pans, and it's a dog. <laughs> and um, unfortunately, I got so many people, the response was they thought I was trying to say the audience was like the dog, which right. wasn't the point. The point was exactly the one that you're making, which is 
Dogs are these intelligent creatures, but yet there's a limit to what they can understand. And we think that they don't understand, for instance, the general theory of relativity. And every time I say that, I always think maybe the dogs are out there that like, oh, they think we don't understand general relativity. <laughs> but, you know. uh, but assuming that's not the case, uh, here, here we have a, a, a very good example of smart beings that are limited in what they can understand. So why is it that we aren't in the same boat? And presumably we are in the same boat. So, so I think that's a given, that we may be limited in what we can understand, but to the specifics of your question, why is it that we think we're making progress? It's very straightforward. We can sit down with the equations of quantum electrodynamics and calculate properties of electrons. Their magnetic properties, the details don't really matter, but the calculation agrees with the measurement decimal by decimal by decimal, 10 places after the decimal point. Right. That's enough, I'm done. I mean, you know, <laughs> think about that. That is an astonishing fact that these strange gloppy things inside of our head can figure out the mathematics to, to understand the property of a particle to one part in, in a billion. Mm. And it agrees with measurement. And at that point you say to yourself, for some reason that we can't quite understand, mathematics provides this powerful illumination into the dark qualities of the universe and allows us to make progress on questions that don't seem to have any relevance to survival, right? But yet somehow the brain has gotten to the point where it can figure these things out. And I shouldn't even say, it's not even, not just they don't have relevance to survival. One imagines that back on the savannah, those of our forebears who got caught up thinking about black holes and quantum physics, they got eaten, yes, yes. right? Yes. You know, so it's like not good for us right. to do this, but yet somehow we're able to. Yeah, well, we have the, the, the last scene that we know about where that was almost certainly true was Archimedes in his bathtub. Yeah, that's a making, curious making one. Making some more breakthrough in, in geometry, and then a Roman soldier just came in and impaled him. Uh, so, first rule of self-defense, you, you stop with the math when someone kicks down your door. Uh, so, oh, so let's, I just want to revisit some of the points you just made there. because So, people have made... I've, I've, I've heard... I've been a consumer of skeptical utterances on this very topic. So, I think yeah. I, there was one... Uh, popular book on physics I read years ago. I think it was probably a John Gribben book. Uh, and it was, he said in there that this, that there's, there's a famous paper by uh, Wigner, I, I believe, The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics and the Natural Sciences or something close to that title. Yeah, that's right. And so it's, it's been pitched as this mystery that mathematics is, uh, seems to map onto reality in a way that is surprising and counterintuitive, and we're, we're still just trying to make sense of that. But I think it was Gribben who wrote that actually the, the idea that mathematics is, it, that it's surprising that mathematics maps onto reality is a little bit like saying it, it's surprising that the English language is, is so good for writing plays in. Right, that there's like, like, like th this is the thing we're, th we're using and we're finding ways to fit it to the circumstance we're in. That is, it seems, it seems to me that there may be a, a serious disanalogy there in that in mathematics, unlike English, seems to indicate, it seems to make predictions about what should be so. I mean, the relationship between electricity and magnetism, say, um, which then can be tested and proven to be true, that the mathematics yeah. itself sort of shines a light in a direction we weren't necessarily looking. Right. Is, there, is, is that, one, is that valid, but is, is, is there more to it than that? Uh, I don't think there's more to it than that, but that's a, a breathtaking quality, yeah. right? I mean, the fact that you, know, you use English to articulate thoughts and describe situations, sure, that's the mode that we have developed for that kind of communication. But mathematics is not a natural language, right? Mathematics is a way that we have found of encapsulating pattern in the world. But yet, when we have identified the pattern, we can then use it to go far beyond the context in which it was developed. So 
you know, Einstein is thinking about space and time and, and the special theory of relativity, 1905, 1906, 1907. Then he takes this mathematics off the shelf in about 1912, a body of mathematics called Ramanian geometry that was largely developed in an abstract realm of mathematics to describe curved shapes, the kind of thing that the idle mathematical mind might find interesting, but not because we were trying to describe the external world. He takes that mathematics, is able to work with it into this generalized version of relativity, the general theory of relativity, and then make predictions about how stars in the distant night sky should look when their light traverses near the sun. Mm. And the way that those positions of the stars shift is then borne out by photographs taken four years later during a solar eclipse when the stars become visible. Yeah. That, that's the craziness, right? He wasn't trying to describe the motion and the position shifting of those stars, and yet he was able to make a statement about something that he had never received any data on, and it agreed with subsequent measurements. Right. That's the part that is absolutely thrilling. Well, so there, there are physicists and mathematicians that have a quasi-mystical, quasi-platonic notion about the significance of all this. Like, so, so what's your explanation, if you have one, for why math seems to reach into the, the darker corners of reality for us? I sort of look at it two ways, and it kind of depends on, on how a given day is going, you know, when you're doing the calculations. I mean, sometimes it feels like you're just sort of chipping away at the stone, revealing the beautiful sculpture, as if it's already out there and all you're doing is revealing it. Other days when it's not going so well, it just feels like you're desperately trying to invent the ideas in order to be able to make progress. So I kind of go back and forth between the two, I have to say. I don't have a consistent view of the role of mathematics in this regard. And I would even say there are times when I have I don't know if worried is the right word, but I've imagined the possibility that one day we make contact with an alien civilization and they say, hey, show us what you guys have figured out. And we bring out the textbooks with all of our beautiful equations and they kind of look at it and they go, nah. They put you in a video where you're the dog. Well, yeah, right. They basically, yeah, exactly, exactly. You know, they, they basically say, you know, we, we tried that for a while. It's kind of a dead end, guys. It'll take you just so far. But then the funny thing is, if I try to imagine what they would replace it with, I don't even, I can't even think of what they would replace it with that isn't in some sense mathematics, perhaps in an unrecognizable form, or an unfamiliar form, perhaps a better way of saying it, because if math is a language of pattern, what are we doing? We're all just trying to encapsulate pattern. So whatever language you use to do that, maybe that is what math ultimately should be described as, and therefore will always be back to this kind of structure. Right. There's another physicist who I've spoken with on my podcast a couple of times, David Deutsch, who I know you know. Um, and I, for, uh, forgive me, David, I've forgotten the reason why you believe this, but I believe he thinks that we are, um, we're, there, in principle, we, can, we as math using language forming cognitive systems, are not cognitively closed to anything that could be known, given, I mean, I, th I think it has, in his mind, something to do with, with a, a, a deep result around information theory and the universality of computation. I mean, it, but I, I, I don't think I can represent his view faithfully here, but he, the, the net result is he thinks that the notion that we could meet an alien intelligence or build a superintelligent computer that we couldn't understand on some level, that where we would stand as the dog in relation to that super intelligent system. He thinks that's a, a, uh, a false fear or, or just in principle impossible. Do you have any reason to, to feel that? Or? I mean, I have to understand more fully exactly what he's saying, but I mean, clearly, if you take our very species and you just, you know, wind the clock back however far you want to go, 30,000 years, 50,000 years, 70,000 years. I mean, there would be a cognitive mismatch relative to where we are today. Yeah. So it's certainly the case that given enough time, we can get to the point, obviously, here we right. are. 
but I could certainly imagine that we encounter an alien intelligence and they are exponentially beyond anything that we have understood and therefore we would be like ants. Yeah. And in fact, I think that's a good possibility as to why they're not paying attention to us. Well, I, th I think that's part of his argument, yeah. I, I actually, that takes me exactly where I want to go, but I think that is part of his argument that we're given enough time or given enough you know, augmentation of ourselves, we could fuse our cognitive horizon with anything else that we could meet. Um, but on, so on that point, where the hell is everybody? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, yeah. the, fir, the maybe you, you can remind people what the Fermi problem is, and and then tell us what you. Yeah, uh, you know, and Enrico Fermi, uh, great physicist, uh, is credited with it's usually framed as the Fermi paradox, I guess, uh, which is look, there's so many stars out there, so many. In fact, now we know for for a fact that there are so many planetary systems out there. Therefore, you expect there's a lot of life out there. Where are they? Why haven't they come and visited us? It's sort of a you know, quick way of describing uh, the question. And, um, but yeah, I think uh, uh, it's an interesting thought to, to contemplate. I think there are many, many explanations for, for why they haven't come here. It could be, like I was saying, we're just not interesting enough, right? I mean, how many times do we stop on the street and, and, and have conversations with bacteria, right? So if we're bacteria, you know, they're like, let's wait, you know, you know, a billion years, and maybe at that point we'll pay some attention. But there are other explanations too. I mean, maybe uh, life is rare, right? I mean, we always have this idea in mind, I think, that at this point life is commonplace. Well, we don't know that. Or maybe life is commonplace, but intelligent life is rare. Right? I mean, if that asteroid hadn't smashed into us 65 million years ago, who knows, maybe it's still dinosaurs walking around and they're not building radio telescopes and sending out spaceships. You know, the other possibilities are, are, are legion. I mean, the universe now, 92 billion light years across, the observable universe in terms of the things that we've had calls of contact with. We have traveled one and a half light seconds <laughs> from Earth. We have sent out probes that have gone out, I don't know, five or six light hours. Right. So to say, why aren't they here? The universe is a big place. And it's not so easy to travel over large distances if you're constrained by the barrier of the speed of light. So what, what's, the, what's our furthest impact on the universe? Just bad television from 70 years ago? Is that? Uh, yeah, so, so if you take, well, seven, so, no, I mean, I guess TV, you know, radio signals. Go, right. go back to, say, the 1900s. So maybe, you know, generously, 150 light years, if you allow, you know, any transmission that we sent out there. That's so 150 cool. light years compared to, you know, 92 billion light years, yeah. right? That's not much. Although I, I, the intuition is that if, because if you, you look at the, the fact that we have gone from you know, barely walking upright to sending out our own space probes in a very short period of time, so you know, 300 years of, of practical science, really. Yeah. And if you think of any, so, so I guess the one assumption you need is that there's nothing really special about Earth. And more and more, it seems that the sense, I mean, even 10 years ago, Earth seemed more special than it does now. Now we're finding planets every day that are seemingly in, in a, some kind of Goldilocks zone with respect to their star. And so if you don't think the conditions on Earth are so special, that they're really a, a dime a dozen out there in the galaxy and in other galaxies, and then you think the, just we're talking about a time window of, you know, any, any place where life gets going and, and it gets complex is very likely on, it could, could be millions of years on either side of us. Anything, anything that's complex that could build a civilization, you know, is, is not going to, that is very unlikely to have happened in the last 300 years. They, yeah. they, they might as well have, you know, 300 years plus 10 million years to have gotten that going, right? So then you, you would expect just the galaxy to be awash in something that we could detect, right, that has been going on for millions of years. Um, 
I guess the one, the, the one additional wrinkle that, that we haven't mentioned is that there could just be something about building a complex civilization, building technology that is lethal yep. to species like ourselves. A absolutely. It could be that they're... We're you know, showing every a, sign of it being, being dangerous. Yeah, right, point, right, yeah. right, exactly. I mean, it could be that once you get to the point where you're able to undertake these kind of grand space journeys, you're in a very dangerous situation, and typically you don't survive. Um, there, are, there are more optimistic ways of, of explaining it, though, too. So maybe the universe is teeming with all this activity, it's just not in the wavelengths that we're looking. We're just not right. sensitive to it, right? Maybe the time scales over which the vibrations of whatever medium that they're using are, are incredibly long or incredibly short. So we just hear it as like noise in the background and don't recognize that there's a signal or we don't even have any sensitivity to it at all. Right. So, so is I think... Their bad television is coming at a different frequency? It could well be. Right, you know, um, so, so I, don't, I don't consider it a paradox. I think it's an interesting point of departure in trying to understand whether we're special, whether life is special, whether intelligence is special. But I mean, from your perspective, right, um, uh, let's say life is commonplace. The journey from life to intelligence is non-trivial. Do you think yeah. that is uh, as straightforward as you might assume in order to come to the conclusion that there should be all sorts of intelligence out there. Well, looking at Earth, you wouldn't draw that conclusion. I mean, Why? Even, even Why do you say that? How well, many species are there on this planet? Well, no, I'm saying, I'm, I, so I, I think I'm agreeing with you. Oh, good. Yeah, okay. that it's, yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm, the truth is I'm even, it's non-trivial even if you look at our own species. Yes, that, that, that's the point. You know? Good, yeah. 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 Uh, <laughs> you know, if, if, uh, you murdered the top, if, if, you, if you took, so how many people on Earth at this moment deeply understand the science required to build intelligent machines, right? So if they, if they all caught a bad virus and died off, how long would it take just the people left to reinvent the computer, right? That's a, that's a non-trivial problem for most right. of us. I mean, if, you, if you leave me alone on a desert island with the, you know, the necessary elements, you're, still, you're not going to get a, an iPhone anytime soon. Uh, and um, so that, I mean, in some sense, we're all, we're all living on the shoulders of, you know, if not giants, on the shoulders of, of legacy institutions and, and ways of doing things that it would be very hard for anyone to recapitulate. I mean, any, even any group of, of especially talented, qualified people, uh, you know, just you just you, you forget how to go, you know, yeah. mine the ore that you need to make that you know, the circuit, right? Uh, so, and that's even assuming the existence of us humans already. I mean, yeah. if you just get rid of that whole particular branch, then you don't even have anything heading in that direction. Yeah, yeah. So it it, it, it strikes me as incredibly tenuous and fragile, yeah. right? Uh, so, and by no means uh, guaranteed to to keep happening. Uh, because again, I mean, the thing that's, that's interesting is that it's, it, it doesn't, what, what we're using to do everything that makes us human is not obviously better from a Darwinian perspective as a matter of survival. I mean, because you know, again, in the long run, we could wind up killing ourselves. Uh, and there are many things that have persisted as themselves, as, you know, as discrete species for tens of millions of years, you know, you take something like a lobster, right? Now, lobsters are just doing their lobster thing year after year after year, uh, and they seem to be fine unless we wind up you know, eating too many of them or destroying their environment. Uh, we, there, there's something uh, quite a bit more precarious about, about our place in the world, and uh, yeah, so it's not, a, even just as a matter, on purely Darwinian grounds, it's not like this surfeit of intelligence and abstract thought is, is clearly something that evolution is an attractor that evolution will keep finding because it's, it's just so good for a right. matter of survival. Right. No, I agree. And I think that's a very natural explanation, uh, not the most uh, optimistic of ones, but yep. certainly is an explanation. Well, I'm rarely accused of optimism, so. <laughs> 
So uh, he optimistically asks, uh, what worries you at this moment in human history? <laughs> <laughs> when you look at how we as a species think about reality and how to live within it, what do you, uh, I, I, you know, you and I don't know each other well at all. I don't know, are, are, do you pay attention to things in the culture even relevant to your science? Like is, is the fact that uh, nuclear proliferation, the prospect of nuclear war, either by design or by accident, the fact that's almost not talked about at all now, and yet every moment of our lives we've been living under this same sort of Damocles, is that something that you spend time thinking about? Or, no. No? Is that, no. Well, no, it's, it's an honest answer, if, if true, but are, are, you, are you not part of any meetings of physicists that, that worry about that? Yeah, or? you know, um, yeah, it's facetious. Uh, so, so, but the truth is, I mean, the, the horror is that it's actually true for, right. for most of us. I mean, it's like we, we have gone to sleep on this issue. Well, I, I would say that that is, is a reasonable description of, of me. I mean, I'm obviously, we all are aware of these issues. I think about these issues. I, I don't, from a day-to-day -day perspective, worry about these issues, nor from a day-to-day -day perspective do I work on these right. issues. Um, and um, it could well be that we have lulled ourselves into a state of complacency by virtue of nothing, you know, catastrophic, you know, happening yesterday or the day before. Uh, I do, you know, walk around the world with an optimistic sensibility yeah. that uh, we will find ways to deal with these issues, but um, that can be a masquerade for an unfortunate complacency at the same time. Mm. So what, what are the, if you could list the problems that you felt we needed to address, if we could, if we could get our priorities straight, what's near the top of your list in terms of? Well, there were the obvious ones that we would all, I think, put there. Uh, you know, we can rattle them off. You started with uh, nuclear proliferation, issues of uh, clean energy, issues of uh, environmental catastrophe, uh, ones, you know, that we just, you know, we were briefly touching upon, you know, when we had dinner just a couple hours ago, issues of, you know, AI, uh, which I would even frame in a, you know, in a somewhat more general um, uh, paradigm, which is I don't think we're very good at having the intuition about exponential growth. Yeah. It's just not yeah. something that we're really good at. I mean, um, you know, everybody, this is a self-selected audience, but anybody who has never heard of, you know, the standard example where, you know, you get a penny on the first day and two pennies on the second and four on the third and so, you know, anybody who hasn't heard that before and learns that by the end of the month you've got a billion dollars plus, right. they're like, what? You know, everybody here knows that, but everybody who's not seen that before, it's very surprising. So I think the scariest things are those which have um, an exponential growth and we're not paying attention to them sufficiently early and we get whacked by the exponential uh, growth of some quality of the world that uh, needs our attention and we didn't give it attention early enough in the process. Mm. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, AI is a possibility along those lines, you right. know. So you, um, you take the notion of a, an intelligence explosion or a, a, some kind of singularity, some kind of breakaway of AI, uh, you take that seriously? You know, I, I would say I take it seriously. It's not something that I, that I fear. I don't deeply fear it. And again, I question my own self about that. Should I be fearing it more? And if I ask myself why I don't, it's because I think fundamentally, fundamentally I think that the people who are responsible for the innovation that, for instance, may yield you know, an intelligence that at some point may far outstrip us. It feels to me that the people leading the charge on that are fundamentally good people. Yeah. I know these people. Some of the, you know, I just feel that they're good people and that ultimately they will pay attention to the safety issues that need to be thought through. Now, this you is on, say their, that, on their 12th Red Bull? It, it could be. It could be, you know. Um, and, and, uh, and, you know, we have examples in the past where we thought doomsday was upon us, you know, you know, nuclear weapons. You know, I mean, there, there are moments where it looked like we were at the precipice and we have found a way to survive, and I guess that has given me an optimistic sensibility 
Uh, it's been challenged, you know, November 8, 2016, it was challenged, it continues yeah. to be challenged, you know, uh, but, but I think fundamentally I'm still in the same place. Right. Well, you're, you're a New Yorker, you'll be fine, right? Yeah, uh, yeah well, so I will not take the, uh, the orange bait there. <laughs> uh, so, well, but to speak generically about politics and kind of culture war issues. So you, I think you and I take a different line here. So I've spent a lot of time arguing for, uh, specifically about the, the there's, there being a kind of zero-sum contest between religion and science, right? Or believing things for good reasons and believing things for bad reasons, or uh, flip that around. Yeah. Um, and you, ha you haven't. I think you've been loath to hit them against one another in a way that will reliably turn people off to science. If you tell people that they, you know, they can't have their resurrection and their cosmology too, a significant number of Americans will say, well, okay, fuck your cosmology, I, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll stick with Jesus. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, obviously you're not alone in that, but so like, for one, do you acknowledge that that's a difference between the way we have kind of played the, the game intellectually? Um, I think so. Yeah. Um, it'd be good to, you know, if, if that's something you want, we probably should, you know, expand on that somewhat, but, but I think that's the case. And, um, um, you know, my feeling from the outside, watching, and I, I don't even mean to put you in this group, because this may not be accurate, but I've certainly seen uh, certain members of the science community going out into the world in a way that I consider um, ineffective right. uh, toward their own stated goal, and that feels irrational to me. Uh, you know, to go out into the world and tell people that you're stupid for certain kinds of beliefs, um, strikes me as not the best strategy, right? I mean, you know, the strategy that I feel works is to go out into the world with a passion and enthusiasm for the things that you think are, are good to understand and important to understand and point in a, in, a, in a valuable direction and to hope that the energy and the momentum from those kinds of conversations will drive things in a good direction. I've never felt the need to go out into the world and slap down other things. Right. That's not how I want to spend my time, and I've never found that an effective approach. Yeah, well, it, it, I, I totally understand that. <laughs> I think there are some, so, so having taken uh, the other line, and, and now <laughs> I, have a, <laughs> I have a fair amount of experience with this. Um, I can tell you that there, there are a few myths here that, that could, could be and perhaps should be retired. One is the idea that, that it simply never works, right? That you can never reason someone out of something they weren't reasoned into. You know, so someone you know, was born to a faith, they've had it drummed into them by their parents, they're now massively attached to it emotionally. Yeah. They, get, they, they get to adulthood, it's still the most important thing in their life. They've taught their children to believe likewise. There's, you can't tell, you can't reason that person out of these, this set of, these sets of convictions. Uh, that's just untrue because I hear from these people all the time who have watched some debate or watched some video, no matter how uh, offensive at first glance. Uh, th they're susceptible to just seeing the, the bad evidence and the bad arguments that have been propping up their faith, you know, low these many millennia. But not to interrupt, let me yeah. just quickly say that I, I agree with the capacity to shift people's attitudes, perspectives, beliefs. Because right. I've had those experiences too, but I've done it a different way. And when I've gotten people coming up to me or writing me emails saying, you know, now that I understand the fundamental workings of the universe a little bit better and understand the cosmology that the other person might have pushed off, but now that I have an understanding of what modern science is saying about these things, I just find it thrilling, and the other things that used to find, find gratifying no longer are working yeah. for me. Well, that, so I mean, so I've seen that too. Right, no, but, that, but that's, you're talking about the carrot, and I'm still talking about the stick on some Yes, point. I agree. So, but the, but I I'm totally just, get it. I'm saying the stick also works, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know so, and but I guess what I've said to you is, if the stick works, 
and the right. Karags. First, I think they're probably working on different people. Let's put that to the side for the right. moment. Which would you rather use? <laughs> I found and you I'm get, saying... I found you can only hit someone so hard with a carrot. Well, <laughs> And, and I found you don't need to hit them at all. Well, so, but I, I should just say, so for instance, just to kind of prep you for your, I think, did, did, I think Travis just announced that you're doing a, an event with Dawkins, right? Yes, that's okay, correct. Okay, so I'm, I'm preparing you for your, your Thank you, appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> Much appreciated, but I've had conversations in a public setting with him before, yeah. but that's okay. Yeah, yeah. please, so, please come. No, but I heard, I heard his, um, I, I heard him over my shoulder when you were talking about the generic, uh, offensive atheist who, who wasn't necessarily me. It might have been Richard. <laughs> uh, but I'm just saying, I'm sure he's sitting on tens of thousands of emails from people who sure. can honestly say, you know, though, though I thought you were an offensive bastard at the beginning, you actually argued me out of my most cherished beliefs. So that, I'm just saying, as a matter of sociology, that happens, right? Yeah, sure. now, but yet it's counterintuitive. We all know that there is this phenomenon. I mean, that we, this has actually been been now uh, studied up to a point, this, this notion of a backfire effect, where you, when you challenge people's beliefs, and you, even when you, you, when you provide them with counter evidence to those beliefs, they, there's some part of the, the human nervous system that just doubles down in the face of, of counter evidence, and they leave this confrontation believing what they believe even more uh, ardently than they did in the first place. So that, that happens. Uh, but I guess it's, I mean, it, in part it's a matter of taste. It's certainly a matter of just how you want to spend your time. I, I completely get that you don't want to be the guy who is just the go-to guy for, you know, why you can't have your, your cake and eat it too in, in the matter of, of science versus religion. But uh, have you ever found yourself on specific issues where the, to take one, so we were just talking about the environment and, you know, and nuclear, the prospect of nuclear war. There are religious ideas that seemingly perfectly inoculate people against viewing those as problems. There's no, there's no degree to which we could despoil the environment, and there's no threat of nuclear cataclysm so salient that could get a fundamentalist Christian, say, who's waiting for Jesus to return and hurl sinners into a lake of fire, to really worry about those problems. Because on, on some level, those are the things that have to happen as precursors to the, the glorious end of the world. I mean, it's, it's, it's you just, as a matter of biblical prophecy, you can just connect the dots and the, you know, things really do have to go to hell in a handbasket in order for the best thing that's ever gonna happen to finally happen. So th those are the, all the signs and, and, and wonders that they're waiting to see, right? Uh, so if you find yourself in the presence of that kind of dogmatism, where the worse things get, really the better they're getting, right. because Jesus is going to come back and solve all our problems. Uh, don't you feel, as a, just as, as a, uh, don't you feel like an, an intellectual and or ethical responsibility as a scientist to push hard on the, those specific beliefs that, that stand in the way of thinking rationally about those problems? Yeah, you know, it's a good question. In fact, it's one that, that I have had that conversation with Richard, hmm. and um, we came to an interesting point, which is I'm rarely confronted with the situation that you describe, and we suspect, at least it emerged from our conversation, because um, there's more of a, a, a focus, if you will, on the biological sciences as the place where a fundamentalist religious perspective will look for a point of confrontation. Yeah, with evolution, yeah. Yeah, then with, you know, somebody who's talking about vibrating strings and extra dimensions and the kind of abstract science that I focus my research attention on. So I'm not in that situation. I'm rarely, in fact, I don't think I'm ever in that situation. And that may, if I were, well, on a regular basis, I'll, I'll come along with you. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll yeah. shatter you. And, uh, I'll take you to a couple of parties. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> you know, you know. Uh, well, so, okay, so back to your uh, areas, areas of controversy in your uh, world. So for, as a consumer of physics from the outside, it seems like many people are worried that 
a, really, a, the, the, the physics as a discipline has been more or less moribund for a generation. That you, ha you have string theory that this is like the most celebrated thing, in, in, or was the most celebrated thing at a certain point, but everyone was sort of just waiting around for it to deliver the goods, and it hasn't yet, and you have a whole generation of physicists that got absorbed by this, this what was a, a kind of intellectual fashion in, in theoretical physics, which may not have panned out and may never pan out. Now this is again, these are the echoes of yeah, 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 disgruntled sure. graduate students that, that one hears. Um, what, what's your view of, of the state of, of physics? Yeah, um, well, y you know, um, I think what you're describing is something that the press has picked up on in various times, and it certainly has echoed in a, in a certain way throughout um, the, the public and throughout the press and so on. But um, the fact of the matter is that physics is in a, in a, theoretical physics is in a very healthy state in that there are a lot of great ideas and there's a lot of substantial progress. And when one says that a theory like string theory has not delivered the goods, mm -hmm. It feels odd for me to hear that. I understand where you're coming from, but it strikes me that it's coming from a place where you've not been within the field sufficiently deep to really see the progress that has been made. I mean, the theory on paper puts together gravity and quantum mechanics. The fundamental theoretical problem of 20th century physics in principle has the solution within string theory. Is it the right solution? We don't know, well, well, but then, that's but then, great progress. But then why is it, why is it controversial? Why isn't everyone a, a string theorist if that, if that marriage has been consummated? Uh, they're just not good enough. <laughs> no, no, it's, um, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, no, no, get, no, a, no. get out on Twitter. No, no, we no, want to no, spread no, this no, around. No. <laughs> the, 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 answer, the answer to that question, and, and uh, please don't tweet, that was just a joke. Uh, but, uh, uh, the answer to that question is, that um, it's extraordinarily difficult to test any theory that puts gravity and quantum mechanics yeah. together. Right. Extraordinarily difficult because we don't have the technological feasibility to test the theory in the domains where it differentiates itself from conventional theories. And this is not just an issue that faces string theory. Any theory that puts gravity and quantum mechanics together is going to face this dilemma. So, if we were able to build an accelerator as big as the galaxy, then we'd be able to test these ideas. That's tough to do in this funding environment. Yes, you know. Right. Uh, uh, so, so that's really the issue. The issue is that on paper, there are features of the theory that are enormously attractive, but we can't test them. Moreover, theorists like myself will also point out the theory itself has gone into some directions that raise questions, interesting questions. A theory that predicts other universes as a possible intrinsic quality of the theory, you got to take a step back and ask yourself, does that make logical sense? Is that a theory that we're willing to take seriously? And, you know, after studying these questions intently for a long period of time, my answer is that, yes, these are worthy of our attention, that these theories may be taking us into the right direction. Uh, do we know that they're right? No. The only thing that will ever establish that they're correct and end the controversy would be to make a prediction and we go out and measure it. And that is the gold standard, and that's something that we've not been able to achieve. Mm. The theory is in many ways in its early stages, even 30, 40 years later. These are difficult questions. So that's the answer, why it's controversial. It's not made a testable prediction. But the theory continues to make substantial progress on understanding the nature of space and time, the nature of black holes. The theory's been able to embrace effectively all of the discoveries of the past. All of them naturally fit within the structure of strength. You don't have to wipe out the past. It embraces the past. These qualities make the theory enormously attractive and compelling. Again, it's not yet been tested. So it hasn't made any prediction analogous to the kinds that Einstein's relativity made that were not a matter of, of having to build some yes. apparatus with insane energies, but just you know, looking up at, 
at the, the bending of, of starlight? Has there been anything like that with string theory that has Absolutely possible? not. No. And, and that's, I mean, you know, it's funny I, that you bring that up. You know, I had a high school student many years ago who did a science talent search project, you know, this competition in the United States where they calculated, this woman calculated the corrections to the bending of starlight by the sun that come out of string theory. Mm. Like, so that's what Einstein did, and right. maybe string theory modifies the prediction. And, and you know, it, it was a thought experiment. I roughly knew what the answer would be, and the answer that she got from calculation turned out to be about the same. It was about one part in like 10 to the 90. Yeah, that's, that's hard. So, so yeah, so, you know, it's, a, it's, it's something that you're not going to be able to measure. It's too small. Yeah, aren't there fewer? 10 to the 88, yeah. Yeah, fewer particles in the entire mind. universe? Yes, right, okay, yes. yes. Uh, so, so we, we, you mentioned m multiple universes. Uh, I think there, there, are men, there are at least a few different ways in which there might be multiple universes. Yeah. Or way, but the, the, there is a many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics that I think to the, I think to, to the alarm of most people who hear about this uh, is very well subscribed among physicists. Right now, where do you come out? You might want to summarize what, why one would be tempted to believe in, in multiple universes. Yeah. But these are, these are universes wherein you know, trillions upon trillions of nearly identical copies of ourselves are having nearly identical conversations, you know, just w w but, but with every different variation of what's possible. So essentially, everything that can possibly happen happens somewhere. So there was, a, there was, there's a if it's compatible with the laws of physics, yeah. yeah. Right. So there was, there is a universe. If you subscribe to this theory, uh, there is a universe in which we had this conversation and then, you know, took our clothes off in the middle of it, right? <laughs> uh, for reasons that presumably made sense in that universe. Wait, wait, let me calculate. Uh, not compatible yeah. with laws of physics. Yes, right. yes. <laughs> yes, this this will not happen in this universe. Rest assured. Uh, but. This is, this is actually believed, right? Now, this, this on its face, to me, is the least believable thing on offer. Right? Yeah. And yet this is, this is not only yeah. subscribed but to, by someone, this is, this is actually just plain vanilla quantum mechanics now. Uh, I wouldn't go that far, no. But I think, there, there's like great for, controversy on this. I mean, David Deutsch, who you mentioned, is one of right. the proponents of this way of thinking about quantum mechanics, but I would not call it the vanilla interpretation of quantum but, mechanics. But I think if you poll people at a physics conference, you get something it's like changed. 30 percent or something that, that believe this. I don't know if 30 percent I would call vanilla, but um, y you know, it changes over time. And, and uh, I, I, first, maybe it's worth quickly saying what it is, yeah. and then I can give you my yeah. perspective it. on it. So, so, so quantum mechanics broke with the past by saying that whereas Newton in classical physics taught us that you can, given the state of the world now, predict how it will be five minutes later or a million years later using the equations of motion to evolve it forward in time, quantum theory came along and said that's the wrong way of thinking about things. If you know everything that you can know about the universe right now, the best you can do is predict the probability, the likelihood that you get one or another outcome when you run the equations forward an hour or 100 million years into the future. Now that sets up an interesting situation because, for instance, if the law says that there's a 50% chance that the electron is here and 50% chance that it's over here, right? When you go to measure the electron, you don't find sort of half of it here and half of it here. You always find one whole electron either here or here. So the question is, if you find the electron in my left hand, what happened to the possibility of it being in my right hand? Right. You might say, well, that just goes away. The problem is just goes away is incompatible with the mathematics. The most straightforward reading of the equation suggests, if you just use the most straightforward interpretation that's right there, the equation suggests that there's actually one universe where indeed you do find it in my left hand, and there's another universe where you find it in my right hand, and therefore there's a copy of me in that universe with two hands, right. thinking that there's only one unique outcome, but there are two of me in distinct universes under that same illusion, that there's only one universe, but the God's eye view, if you don't mind me using that metaphor, is that there are, <laughs> there are, there are, this universe. There, there are many universes out there, and basically anything that's allowed by the laws of quantum physics is represented in this menagerie of universes. Now, if you ask me, do I subscribe to this way of thinking about quantum mechanics, 
My answer is no. Mm -hmm. And the reason is, um, I'm not saying that it's wrong, I'm saying that we're not at the point yet where we can answer that question. Because there's a gaping hole in the structure of quantum mechanics that maybe doesn't get enough air time. Quantum mechanics, in my view, and many others, but this is not universal, is not a complete subject. We're missing a solution to the so-called quantum measurement problem, which simply is the question, when you measure the position of a particle like an electron, how do you go from this weird, fuzzy mixture of multiple possibilities? It's over here and it's over here, and there's some kind of fuzzy mixture of the two. How do you go from that fuzzy probabilistic description in the equations to the single definite reality that emerges when you actually undertake the observation? Right. How do you go from fuzziness to definite reality? And this is a question that we do not know the answer to. And since clearly, in thinking about where the possibilities go, the act of measurement or observation is intrinsic to the very question that we're talking about, until we answer that question, we can't really come to a conclusion on what the right way of thinking about quantum mechanics is. Do you think we're far enough along that we can conclude that there is no answer that goes down easily with respect to our intuitions? That, no. that, that any answer is going to seem crazy? No, no I don't think so. Okay. Uh, there is a version of quantum mechanics that's sort of the dark horse version of the theory due to somebody named David Bohm. Yeah. Yeah. Also, Louis de Broglie had the same idea a couple decades earlier. And this version of quantum mechanics that's virtually never taught, never spoken about in public, right. has the quality that particles still go along trajectories, right? The, the new idea of quantum mechanics is, in the traditional way that one talks about it, is particles don't move on trajectories. It's just those nebulous waves that are evolving in some weird quantum space called Hilbert space, not even the space that we live in. That's the reality that's being described by the equations. But David, David uh, Bohm came along and said, no, there's a version of this theory in which particles still go along definite trajectories. Right. And, and that's closer to our intuition about how the world works. So this way of thinking about quantum mechanics were to bear fruit, if that's the right way of doing it, it will be somewhat closer to our intuition than the version that we currently talk about. Wait, re remind me, what, what do you, you, I still recall you have to sacrifice something that we're uh, attached to as a matter of common sense with Bohm. Is it, you, have, you have to sacrifice locality, right? I mean, it's, it's a, it's a non-local. That's theory. right. So, so it has the weird property that, you know, you do something over here and it affects something over here instantaneously. Yeah, and over and here it can be in Andromeda. It could be in yeah. the other right. side of the universe. Yeah. Now, uh, you say, as you rightly do, we're giving something up. And therefore, that suggests that there are other versions of quantum mechanics where you don't have to give that up. But the fact of the matter is, even in the most straightforward version of quantum mechanics that we teach to our students all the time, there is a non-local quality already. It's called entanglement. Yeah. It's the Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen contribution in 1935, which showed that if you have a particle over here and a particle over here, you do a measurement over here, measurement, right? So again, this unknown quality called quantum measurement comes into the story. But you do a measurement over here, and it affects the particle over here. This is what Einstein called spooky. Spooky action at a distance. You do something here, and it affects something over there. But that's within the standard formulation of quantum mechanics as well. In this Bohmian version, it's made more explicit. It's more in your face. Right? It's right there in the math. You don't have to do analysis to find it. But in a sense, you're not giving something up because you've already given it up with quantum mechanics. Right. Now, it's very um, fashionable in New Age circles to find solace in one interpretation of quantum mechanics, which is usually described as the Copenhagen interpretation, which privileges this measurement moment of, of uh, the, the, the role of consciousness in determining the nature of reality. And Einstein famously said, you know, I, 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 do, do you really think that the moon doesn't exist unless I'm looking at it as a way of disparaging this, this uh, view? My sense from talking to physicists of late is that, that interpretations of QM that privilege the role of consciousness are less and less fashionable to the point of being more or less retired now. Is that, is that actually where it, where it is? And, and do you 
What do you think about consciousness as, as a part of this puzzle? Well, uh, it, it's a very hard question because you can't ever get out of your head, right? I mean, if you imagine a measurement being undertaken not by a conscious being, but by a computer or some mechanical device, you'd say, well, there's no conscious quality involved, and therefore consciousness can't play a role in the process, you still need to go over and look at the device to see whether it's accomplished what you set it out to do. So it's very hard to ever get outside of the framework in which a conscious being is brought in at some point in the quantum mechanical story. And that's what makes it hard to excise it fully. However, having said that, it, there's no reason that we can possibly see where consciousness plays a fundamental role in the quantum unfolding, right? I mean, you write down the basic equations and they apply to individual particles and whether those individual particles are grouped together in some amorphous mass or into this nicely organized structure that allows some kind of internal processing to take place, it doesn't seem to matter to the equations. That's an add-on and therefore it doesn't seem that consciousness is, is vital to the story. So, um, I don't think so. I don't think consciousness is essential. And I would just underscore one point. We talk about interpretations of quantum mechanics, as if quantum mechanics exists, and we're just sort of sitting back trying to say, what do we make of it? That's not the situation. Yeah. These so-called different interpretations are attempting to resolve this unsolved problem of quantum measurement. And that's a real issue. And therefore, it can well be the case that these aren't just different interpretations, they're different theories. And if we understand them well enough, and we finally have a solution to the measurement problem, we might find that it's not that we were struggling with interpretations, we were struggling with actually giving birth to the full theory itself. Mm. And I suspect that that's where things will ultimately turn out. Right, right. Well, I know we have to uh, go to questions soon. I just, I just have one more question I want to ask you before we do, but perhaps if that needs to be prepared at any, uh, with mics, um, we should do that. Uh, but what is the status of the, the concept of time in physics now? I mean, we, you know, most of us know that space and time got married with, with Einstein, and so that you, you, we speak of, of space-time as opposed to time on its own, but uh, I mean, t time, time is a, you know, both space and time are uh, intuitions we have. I mean, they're, they're, they're kind of, our nervous system is sectioning reality in such a way as to naturally produce these concepts for us. And there's every reason to believe now, it sounds that, like, that our common sense about space and time is not, in fact, what they are as a matter of physical reality. Uh, but there are concepts in physics, like the concept of a block universe, right, that suggests that we're, we're radically at odds with, with what reality is, that it, it, under some construal, the future exists just as much as, as the present, uh, and, the, and as does the past. And, so where, what, can you give us a kind of a potted uh, view of, of what time is uh, from the point of view of physics today? Yes. And, and as a matter of time, you have two minutes. Yeah. <laughs> so before Einstein came on the scene, everybody had the intuitive notion of time, and that was the very notion of time that was in the equations of physics that, that Newton gave us. And when Einstein came along, he shattered that perspective, first in 1905, I think as many are familiar, by showing that objects in motion will find that their clocks do not tick off time at the same rate. Right. That's crazy, right? We used to think there is a time that we're all relentlessly moving forward within, second after second, and if you're in relative motion, your clocks won't tick off time at the same rate. That's crazy. Then and, and that's been also experimentally established. That's not just a matter of the theory. We, we've sent clocks around the world in airplanes and, and our, our GPS relies on, the, on, on taking that into account and all of that. Absolutely right. We've got particles and accelerators that are living 
much longer than they would if they were sitting on a table because their clock is ticking up time more slowly. Right. So this is beyond doubt. Then 1915, Einstein gives us general relativity, and we learn that it's not just motion that affects the passage of time, it's also gravity affects the passage of time. Mm. So if you're near a strong gravitational source, time will tick off far more slowly than it is if you're far away from that gravitational source, that gravitational potential. Again, that's kind of a crazy idea, right? You hang out near the edge of a black hole and time for you elapses more slowly than for somebody who is far away. Now these are all giving us insights into strange and unexpected features about the nature of time and also space, which is melded together as you indicated. But the deeper question is the one that you asked toward the end, which is, is time and space are these fundamental structures in reality or do we impose them on reality in order to organize our inner perception and it's a very hard question I don't know the answer to it but I will say this one of the features of string theory in the last few years some really remarkable work has gone a really giant step forward towards showing that space and time may not be fundamental structures. They may emerge from more basic ingredients that naturally arise in string theory. So, you know, this is, emergence, of course, is a familiar idea in many subjects. You know, we all know what temperature means. We know when things are hot, when they're cold, but then you dig deeper and we know that temperature actually is a reflection of how quickly molecules and atoms are moving. Something's hot when the average motion is fast. Something's cold when the average motion is slower. So that gives us a deeper understanding of what temperature is in terms of more fundamental entities. Yeah. We've now taken a step toward that kind of progression for space and time. There's work in string theory that shows that space may actually be stitched together by the threads of the quantum entanglement that we were describing before, that non-local quality of quantum mechanics. We've been able to do calculations within string theory, in essence, where we're able to cut the threads that are keeping the fabric of space together. Nothing to worry about, just mathematics. <laughs> but, you know, we, we cut these threads and we're able to see that what remains are sort of isolated points that no longer stitch together in the manner of our familiar conception of what space is. So this, to me, is, is probably the next revolution. If you ask me what the next revolution is, it's going to be a way of thinking about physics in which space and time are not put in at the get-go into the equations, mm. but rather emerge later on when certain environmental conditions are met, and when they are met, space and time as we intuitively know them will emerge, but when those conditions are not met, there can be realms of the universe in which there is no conventional notion of space and no conventional notion of time. Mm. Right. Well, unfortunately, on this stage, there's a very conventional notion of time. Mm. Uh, so uh, we would love to get your questions, and we'd love the house lights to change so that we can see some of you. Right. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> we will just uh, go left and right here. Um, Uh, we'll start over here. Thank you. Yeah. And just just to remind everybody, questions questions often end in a high rising tone. So if you can achieve that, you're you're good. Uh, thank you. Hi, I just want to say thank you for the talk. Okay, I found it very interesting, and uh, thank you to you both for coming to Toronto. Oh, um, I think mm -hmm. fine. Thank you. Uh, my question kind of loosely relates to kind of what you guys talked about in the beginning, and there was a scientist, Sam, you talked about, who you said you don't know why he came to this conclusion, but there was oh, no David way, Deutsch, yeah, yeah it's, there's no way to conceivably think of AI or an alien species that um, humans can't comprehend. I, my question kind of loosely relates to that, and I kind of have to preface it with um, a quick explanation of experiments, how I think about it in my head. Um, I don't really know what the experiment is called, but it's like the red dot experiment where ex a scientist would put a red dot on different animals' mm -hmm. forehead and yeah, put a mirror yeah, in front of them. Yeah, self-recognition. Yeah, and kind of rank 
their level of intelligence or their level of um, capacity of consciousness. Yeah. And I was wondering if maybe both of you have an opinion on this, whether humans kind of have an analogous kind of red dot point where there becomes a problem or an issue where just our biology or our, our capacity of knowledge or, or consciousness, you know, we might look at the answer of the problem right in the face and just not be able to see it. Like it's right there, but yeah. we just can't comprehend yeah, it yeah. within our... Um, so I guess for both of you kind of is appropriate because Sam, your deep, your primary concern is consciousness and level of thought. And Brian, I, I assume that you and your colleagues are probably gonna be at the forefront butting heads with these problems. Um, so I guess my question is, do you guys think that there's a limit or can humans just continually expand basically yeah, forever? Yeah, well, it's an interesting analogy that I, I haven't really uh, thought of before. But so, so just to remind you all about what that is, there's this mirror self-recognition test that has been done on various species of animals. And most species, no matter how smart they appear in other ways, if you put them in front of a mirror, they don't warm up to the realization that that's them in the glass. They relate to that, that other species as a, that, that, that image as another member of their species. Uh, so, and, and embarrassment ensues. Uh, <laughs> but there are certain species that, that very few, that can gradually recognize that, that you know, the, the, based on their own movements, that the, you know, the, the dot is on their heads. Um, and, I think we are, I was so just, it's very easy to see personally, I mean, I, I think you know, it's easy to see that one as an individual has certain limitations, certain things to which one is, is cognitively and emotionally and just dispositionally closed, right? And certain games you can't play or, or you certainly can't play uh, in any, with, under any kind of time horizon that make it pragmatic for you to attempt to play those games, right? So like if you put, put in a room with the, the Martians for a long, like how long does the conversation have to go on to fully explore your cognitive limits? Well, you know, for many of us, not all that long, right? And then the question is how, you know, but, but it, my, my sense is that well, be, this is another question I could ask you, too, that fits in here. If you could nominate one member of our species, past or present, who did not, just as a, as a brain that would be best suited to, to explore the limits of human cognitive horizons in the presence of superintelligent aliens, who would, you, who would you put in that room to just say, okay, this is humanity, this is the, the best we've got in, in terms of... <laughs> Dialogue with Sam the species. I know Justin Bieber. No, it, yes, um, no, no. But, um, uh, you know, I, I I don't know, and I think part of the answer to that question. But, is, well, I mean, let me just give you a candidate. So it's either John von Neumann, or it's Isaac Newton. You can give them all the modern understanding. I'm just like a, just a, a brain to just just put there. I guess I would be uncomfortable because they're really smart at certain things. Yeah. But like, why not Shakespeare or Freud? I mean, there's just well, so many different ways of, of well, engaging reality. I can, I can reality. tell you why not Freud, but... What's that? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I, I right. stopped myself halfway yeah. through. Yeah. Uh, uh, but interesting, you knew where I was going with yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, um, I think intelligence comes in, in a, a wide variety of different forms. And uh, it, it could be, as you're suggesting, that the answer's right in front of us and we don't see it. I, I, I suspect that's a real possibility. But I'll give you one data point. And I'm not sure how relevant it is, but at least it gives me some sense of optimism. When I was a graduate student a long time ago, it seemed like the amount of material that you needed to learn in order to even begin to do your research for the degree, the doctoral degree, was like, incredible, right? I mean, so how are you going to study all this and then have time left to do the project, but yet somehow we're able to do it. And now, you know, 35 years later, whatever it is, 
with all of the progress that's been made, I mean, the kids that come into string theory, they have to learn everything that I had to learn back then, and they have to learn the past 35 years of it too, and yet they still have to be done in the same number of years. Yeah. And somehow they're able to do it. So, so it feels to me that... They still have Instagram accounts to tend to. <laughs> that, that's the amazing thing, and, and Fortnite. You know, they still play Fortnite, <laughs> you know? Um, so, so it strikes me that there's some way that we're able to adapt to the ever greater volume of, of information and knowledge that we need in order to make progress. So I guess what I'm saying is, the fact that we've not hit that wall gives me hope that we're pretty good, we're pretty flexible. But could it be, logically speaking, that there is a wall and all that we're looking for is just an inch beyond that wall and we can't quite see through it? Yeah. yeah. That was kind of more what I was, not necessarily an individual, single human that represents the best, but more like, you know, 200 years ago in terms of evolutionary time, we're pretty much the same, but drastically yeah. different. Like, will that just continue? Will we eventually be the green-headed aliens coming down with super magical technology, or will we get to a point where the well, as, lo as long as we keep going, I mean, I, th I yeah. think it's c the leverage is culture. I mean, yeah. we, we we keep we keep porting our not our all the gains into culture, and then there's a kind of a chunking. I mean, this this explains how each new wave of graduate students can kind of recapitulate the history of of intellectual progress in physics in their own lifetime and you know, know more about physics than Einstein did, and then, and then keep going. Um, it's, uh, anyway, interesting question. Uh, over here. Thank you. um, you're probably both aware of, of Niels Bohr's position. Physics is to be regarded not so much as the study of something a priori given, but rather as the development of methods of ordering and surveying human experience. So it's right. less finding the photon that's actually there and, and more um, making sense of those lines as a picture of an old woman or a young woman. Yeah. What's, what's your take on, on Bohr's position? Well, I think we, we actually, in deference to time, I'll say we, we yeah. sort of covered that in talking about the Copenhagen interpretation of, of physics. I mean, it was, he was the, the originator of that interpretation. And, uh, you know, the, the, the sense at that point, when, when, when quantum mechanics was first being born, there was a very strong sense that the universe was more mind-like than matter-like based on that view of things. And you know, feel free to correct me if I'm, I'm wrong here, but I feel like the conversation at the very least has, has widened and moved on, and it, we're not quite there with, with Bohr's take on it. Yeah, the one thing I would add to that is, you know, Bohr, Bohr had a view of the world, which is aligning with what you're saying, is ultimately, Science is about explaining observations and data. It's not about peeling back the curtain and seeing the fundamental reality. And I think Bohr was forced into that position by virtue of the fact that he couldn't peel back the curtain. And quantum mechanics was working, and yet he was unable to tell us what it was telling us about the true nature of reality. So he said, don't worry about the true nature of reality. That's not what physics is about. And I think it's a very limited way of looking at science. I'm not so interested in being able to only predict the results of experiments. I like that, that's the gold standard, but in the end of the day, when I'm on my deathbed, I hope that I have some deeper understanding of what's reality, of what's behind that curtain. And if all that we're doing is being better able at predicting results of experiments to further decimal places down the line, I'd rather be doing something else. Over here. Hi, thank you both for coming. My question is for Sam. Uh, earlier in the talk, you asked Dr. Green about what issues keep him up at night. And aside from nuclear proliferation, I was wondering if you could share with us your answer for the same. Uh, well, largely it is kind of the, the meta issue mm -hmm. of our reliable failure to make sense to one another and have conversations that productively, that lead to, to, to the solution of problems in any kind of direct way. You know, so the fact that we have political systems that can't function over a long time horizon, you know, we've got this you know, four-year election cycle presidentially to, to worry about, and therefore it's impossible to have a 
a 40-year plan about anything, right? And, and we have, and we, we, have, we have problems whose time horizon is long or longish, and we have, we have problems that are global in nature. So the, by definition, we can't solve these individually as, as nation states, and we can't solve these by fixating on the, the incentives of a, you know, a four-year election cycle. And in the midst of all that, we have a level of, of polarization, whether it's you know, political or, or you know, it's ideological across the board. It's, it's religious. It's, I mean, there, there are many things that contaminate our conversation with one another, which make it imp virtually impossible to make sense long enough and, and productively enough to get all of us to converge on, I mean, even just even to recognize what the problems are, much less the, the, how to solve them. So um, I, I just think that the, I think conversation is all we have, successful conversation is all we have to solve our problems together. And so when I see it just break down, not only frequently and catastrophically, but reliably so, it's like you can, you can just guarantee that the conversation is gonna be ineffectual, uh, given where most people are most of the time. That, that's, that's what worries me, and that's kind of the meta problem that, that subsumes all the others, whether it's climate change or, or nuclear war pr proliferation, or how do we deal, how do we deal with uh, emerging pandemics or the prospect thereof? You know, why can't we decide to make more antibiotics that we, when we know we're running out of them? Um, we just can't agree how to create systems that, that incentivize things we know we want to do or should know we want to do because we, we, can't, even, we can't even talk uh, coherently enough about these things. So, uh, Thank you. Yeah. Over here. Thank you. Uh, hi. Um, hey. So uh, Sam's opening question for Dr. Green was, um, what is it that gives you uh, optimism about that uh, one can make progress, uh, um, I guess, intellectually? And your answer was that we can prove the outcomes, or we can predict the outcomes of experiments. M the most recent question you actually said, if that's all we're doing, um, you'd rather find something else to do. Um, and during your talk, you, t you uh, said that the quantum measurement problem is the f gaping hole in the quantum, uh, quant the theory of quantum theories or theory of quantum mechanics and makes it almost impossible to choose between uh, those that emerge. Um, and so it seems that there's no path to a place where the thing that you, that gives you confidence that we can make progress, no path exists to that state. Do you retain confidence in the endeavor? You know, I've, I've, I've never quite thought of it that way, and uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm kind of devastated. Uh, no, um, so, so a few things. First off, when I talk about what gives me confidence in the approach that we're following, it's the fact that we have a powerful diagnostic that tells us whether we're going in the right direction. That diagnostic is not the final reason we do what we do. But that diagnostic is, can you make a prediction? Can you test it with an observation or an experiment? And I love it as a diagnostic. I don't love it as the end game. And that's the difference between the two. Now, in terms of the, the quantum measurement problem itself, it's a very curious state of affairs because we have an algorithm called a quantum algorithm that allows us to make predictions for the result of an experiment even though the intermediate step, we don't understand how the universe makes that intermediate step, and that's the hole that I was describing earlier. But nevertheless, the algorithm works, and that's borne out by the agreement between prediction and observation. So it's not as though we're, we're fully at sea and the boat's about to tip. We are incredibly on course but there are vital pieces of the story that we've yet to figure out. Now, I should say, there are other physicists who would be up here and saying there is no quantum measurement problem. Mm. I mean, my good friend, um, 
You know, Anton Zeilinger, you know, this is, a, this is a brilliant man who doesn't just do quantum physics calculations, he actually does the experiment. So this is like the real deal, not like someone just spouts off about these ideas. He actually does the stuff. And you know, when I sit with him and talk with him, he kind of has an avuncular attitude toward me. He says, hey, you can worry about those kind of things if you want to but you're wasting your time because there's no problem, Brian. And, and, and so that's his perspective. It works, we have an algorithm, and we can make predictions and end of story. So, so it's just to say that there are different attitudes as to whether this is an issue because I think there are different goals that we have as scientists. As we were saying to the uh, earlier question, some of us just want to be able to predict, some of us want to be able to enlighten. And whether that latter goal is misguided, I don't know. I don't think it is, but some in the field certainly do. Thanks. Hello, my name is Brendan. I'm an intern on some of the dark matter experiments at Snow Lab, and I, I have a question for Brian. I was curious, seeing the results from many recent dark matter experiments that have search larger energy spaces and are possibly indicating it may not exist and that brings into question some of the predictions of supersymmetry. So I was wondering what do you think the plan B is if that doesn't work out? Well, just 30 seconds on the background and everybody I think knows that since the 1930s there's been increasing evidence that there should be more stuff out there than we see, dark stuff because <laughs> We need something to give rise to an additional gravitational tug responsible for the motions of stars and galaxies that we observe. So for a long time now, we've been trying to go out and find this dark stuff. We assume that it's raining down on Earth. We don't see it, but we build detectors in hopes that we will. Can, can you spell out what dark means in this context? This dark solely means that it doesn't give off light. Right. And that's really all that it is. So it's, uh, many of the proposals involve particles that uh, as the questioner asked, some of them are exotic species of particles that come out of theories like string theory or more generally supersymmetry. And we had hoped, and the hope is not dead, that these experiments would capture one of these dark particles, particles that don't give off light, that don't interact with the electromagnetic force. That's right. a more precise way of saying it. Uh, but we've come up empty-handed for a long time. So what's the answer to this? There are a number of answers. Number one, it could be that we just got to keep on looking and we'll find it. I think that's the, the bread and butter answer that many people still have. More exotic answer is that perhaps there is no dark matter at all and maybe it's our understanding of the force of gravity that needs to be modified. And that's why things are moving in a way that doesn't comport with our previous understanding of gravity and that motivated the introduction of this new stuff to make up the difference, but maybe it's gravity that's not doing what we think it should be doing. Uh, and a third possibility, which is an elaboration of that, is there are exotic ideas that have emerged from string theory, so-called holographic ideas. It'd be a bit involved to explain it in any detail, but some of those ideas suggest that there's no need for dark matter at all that the natural solution to the mismatch between observation and prediction is resolved in these more exotic approaches to understanding the force of gravity. So those are two and a half, roughly three possible plan Bs. Thank you very much. Hi there, I'm Vlad and this question is for Sam but I'd love to hear Brian's thoughts as well. Um, Sam, you see our efforts to make moral progress as us navigating the landscape of possible states of consciousness, and the way to navigate that space is uh, through science. Uh, I would generally agree with this, but I think that there are certain categories of navigation problems to which science cannot provide an objective answer due to the fact that there are many types of beneficial mental states that are qualitatively different from each other and not readily comparable. So for example, mm -hmm. loving another person, or the joy of working to create something, or mindfulness helping others, et cetera. Right. And it may be the case that achieving a peak in one area, let's say intense meditation or mindfulness, may necessitate suffering in another area, let's say the love that comes from close personal relationships. So my question is, how can we ever determine which is more important? How can science help us navigate when realizing one beneficial conscious state 
is in conflict with realizing another beneficial but qualitatively different right. state. And, and you want me to weigh in on this too? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That'd be great. Yeah. <laughs> you, can, you can say as much as I said about dark matter. And everything. <laughs> uh, well, so uh, there's a couple of intuitions there that I would just want to push on. One is the, the idea that not being able to answer th those questions uh, is a problem for, the, for the, the claim that there is an answer to those questions. So, so this is, in my book, The Moral Landscape, I, I differentiated answers in practice from answers in principle. There, we know there are, there are many facts of the matter for which there, there are answers in principle and trivially easy answers in principle, just, just integer-based answers. You know, like how many grains of sand are there on Earth, right? You know, as long as we define grain of sand clearly enough, you know, that is an integer answer. Um, and yet we know we'll never have access to that information, and it probably just changed anyway, right? So, uh, uh, you know, or even simpler, you know, how many, the, the example I've often used is, you know, how many birds are in flight over the surface of the Earth at this moment, right? Well. It just changed, and we know we're never going to get the data. So, but there was, there was an answer to that question. Uh, there are other kinds of questions where there, there are no clear answers, but there's, there are ranges of answers. There's kind of a blurry you know, uh, haze around the right answer. Uh, and, it's, and some of these are just norms of you know, just how we run society. It's like, well, what's the right age to give someone a driver's license? Well, you know, when I was 15 and a half, I thought, you know, 16 was, was probably a little too late. Uh, now, when I drive and I look over and I see a 16-year-old behind the wheel of a, a 4,000-pound automobile, I think that looks insane to me, right? <laughs> so self-driving cars can't come soon enough. But, but what is the, what's the right answer? Well, given all things considered, like so, and it's, a, so it's an all things considered situation where we, we know we can never do this perfectly. We know that some 16-year-olds are really not up to it, but we have to draw the line somewhere. Wherever we draw the line, it's going to be arbitrary. 16 is arbitrary. 16 and a half is ar arbitrary. 18 would be arbitrary. And, y and, there's, and yet, it's, we know there are wrong answers. We know that six months is definitely the wrong answer. Right? <laughs> so if you shift the window of consideration there, so you're, just, you're not capturing anything we care about. If you move it to, to 16, well, you're, you know, not, if we moved it to 25, you know, fewer people would die. There's no question, right? But we have other concerns beyond body count. We have, you know, mothers and fathers who are just sick of driving their kids to school every day, right? <laughs> so what's that worth? And we, 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 we play around with this, and we know we're never going to do the math sufficiently so that we know, to, you know, down to our toes, that we've got it perfectly right, right? But it doesn't mean that there aren't better and worse answers in that space. We know there are worse answers. You know, six months you know, just gets you absolutely nowhere, and 100 also doesn't work, right? So uh, the answer is somewhere along this continuum. And, and for many things in life, we have to be satisfied with that. Now, I think we'll, we, we will be less and less satisfied the more we can get our hands on really good data and the more our technology allows us to, to use that data in ways. And I, think that, and I think this will be surprising. So, I mean, just, I mean, this, is, this is true in medicine in many ways. It's like, like when there's nothing to do about a condition, right? There is no cure, there's no understanding of its basic biology, and yet people are suffering mightily, you know, it's like polio, right? People are, are it, was, it used to be a common feature of life, even in the most uh, affluent areas, that people would, would be hobbled and killed by polio, right? Now, we've lost sight of that horror because we have a, we have a, a vaccine for polio and have had it, you know, for as long as, as most of us have been alive. Um, now, Preventing polio is a trivially easy thing to do, and if you, if you decided, I mean, those, the people who are, you know, against vaccines across the board or, or so worried about the possibility that they have some other downside or who are kind of preventing uh, their kids from, from getting vaccinated, um, you know, in a very local area, it may not cause a problem for them or the people around them, but if enough people do it, 
we'll be back to the days of polio, right? And so that, so like, that is clearly no place worth going, right? And it becomes, you know, you, you move from an environment in which you have this devastating thing for which there's nothing to do and, and you just gotta sort of pray it doesn't happen to you, to it's a trivially easy solve and you're irresponsible if you don't do it, right? And, and, and those, we will continually be buffeted around by those kinds of changes based on knowledge and, and, and changes in technology. Uh, but I, the, my main resistance to the, to the question is the idea that a lack of answers in practice means that there are no answers in principle. Uh, and, and that a blurry boundary around the right answer uh, means that the difference between better and worse, or, and even much, much better and much, much worse, uh, goes out the window. I think, that's, I think we, we still have that, no matter how dimly we understand our situation on any of these things. So, yeah, I hope that made sense. I mean, you know, let me just, yeah, go for it. again, the only thought that occurs to me, and uh, I may not be fully appreciating the nuance of the question, so apologies, but one of the things that we certainly teach to our students, you know, standard physics issue with students is um, it's critical to pose a well-formed question. And a well-formed research question is one that's not over-determined, not under-determined, but it's one that has an answer. And that's a very hard step to get to, to properly frame a question so that there is a procedure by which an answer can emerge because the system is not underdetermined, it's not overdetermined, it's not self-contradictory, right. and there is a unique answer to be found. And, and the issues that you're describing are ones that typically are underdetermined. So yeah. I'm a little bit confused when you say, you know, the answer is somewhere between here and here. What do you mean by the answer? Well, I mean, it's an it, underdetermined question. In this case, right? well, you know, what should be the driving age? No, no, I understand right. the question, yeah. but it's an underdetermined question. There is no right answer to it based on the, it's not a well-posed question. I mean, you can make decisions, like you say, and various people will come up with different propositions for what the good policy should be, but there is no the answer in the sense that there's, you know, there is an electron magnetic moment, right? There is a the answer in that situation, because it's a question that's posed in a specific way. But, the, so, but there is a, a, gradient, a gradient, and if you go far enough in one direction, Absolutely. You, you can feel yourself getting you know, colder, 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 colder. Totally got that. And then you go back warmer, warmer, warmer. Totally warmer. got right. it. So, but that doesn't yeah. mean that there is a the answer. Yeah, no, no, so the, in those cases, any answer within a certain boundary may just seem arbitrary, because it will be arbitrary. You, don't have, you can't specify the, the right answer. I agreed. Yeah. Okay. But, <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Hi, uh, my name is Daniel. Um, I was wondering if I could get uh, both of your thoughts on the role of the social stigma, the societal stigma against being wrong, uh, the, the role that that plays in political, philosophical, even, and even scientific discourse, and assuming that that role is negative and substantial, what can we do on a both a personal and societal level to mitigate and combat that stigma? Mm. Yeah, good question. I, I, mean, I would add to that, and I'll pitch it to you first. The, there's a stigma around saying you don't know something, and, and, and there's, a, there's a asymmetry here. So in science, there, there's very little stigma around this. In fact, f people, d scientists defensively say they don't know all the time so as not to embarrass themselves in front of people who know more than, than they do uh, at a conference. So, but but, if, but if, you put a if you put a scientist on television and get him or her talking about global warming or whatever it is, and they start issuing the responsible scientific caveats about, well, we're not, you know, I'm not an expert on this or I don't know that, yeah. that doesn't translate well into, you know, popular journalist, the, the journalistic consumption of, of, of information. And it's, if you put that person up against some yeah. Bible-thumping blowhard who knows everything, <laughs> Uh, they lose. So, so totally get it. Yeah. And, and, and that's why there is not a single uh, video of me, and I say this with 100% confidence, because I have never been on television talking about something that I did not feel expert in. Right. I'm not interested. 
I get all sorts of calls to talk about things like the climate and features of that sort, and I don't do it. Why? For exactly the reason that you're saying. Um, I am comfortable saying I don't know, but that's not the place to be saying it. Right. Um, so, to your question, um, you know, uh, it is the case, as Sam is saying, that uh, we recognize, certainly as theoretical physicists, that most of what we do in our life will be wrong. <laughs> not because we made a mistake. Sometimes we will make a mistake. That's the hard time when that happens. But it'll be wrong in the sense that it will be irrelevant. Nature won't take any interest in the direction that our research took us, so whatever we published will just rot away in some journal someplace. And, uh, and that's true for the vast majority of what we will do, and to be a theoretical physicist, to come to terms with that early on. And um, so we're very comfortable with being wrong in that sense. Um, and I think that's a very valuable lesson, and it is a good one to have, and it does allow us freedom because we're not constantly worried, well, if I go that direction, I'll be wrong. Go no, we just go. And that allows us to have unexpected eureka moments that change everything. But that's as a community. The individual will go down many blind alleys, and that's just how it is. Mm. Well, well, how do you experience the, this larger phenomenon, which is related, of people having a kind of confirmation bias and a sunk cost bias that keeps them wedded to a theory that is almost certainly wrong, for which there's you know, good evidence to, to believe that you know, they, they wouldn't come to it that way now, and you have, it absorbs decades or, or at least years of, of their time. Uh, I've never seen that happen. Yeah, yeah. so yeah, right. So, but the, what, what's, what's often celebrated in science is that that happens less in science than anywhere else. Like in science, you win points even for proving yourself wrong or for, yeah. or for disavowing the thing that yeah. made you famous last decade because it, there's, there's now new data. Well, and hopefully when, you're the one that finds the problem with it. Yeah. Uh, but, um, but, you know, I, I think we have confidence that we're part of a community that's incredibly skeptical, that's always investigating itself. Any idea that's put forward, the rest of the community takes a sledgehammer and starts to smash on it, trying to break it. And so we feel confident that if it doesn't break, it's worthy. It's worthy of further attention and further study. So from that perspective, it's so rare for an idea to sort of hang out there and the community says it's okay and, and tries to smash the cancer it, and it's completely irrelevant, completely wrong, we've all been deluded. It's such a rare phenomenon. So I believe it's really the fact that we're part of this community that's self-policing. It, it doesn't need something from the outside to come in and pass judgment. It's an internal self-correcting mechanism that allows it to make progress. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just, my name's Mike. Uh, hi, Brian and Sam. Uh, I'm very appreciative okay. that you guys are here and very thankful that we had uh, such a privilege to hear you talk about such high-level topics. Well, thanks for coming. Um, I have a question that pertains in part to both of you, and you'll each have your own area of expertise to maybe give some input on it. Um, you didn't really get to talking about uh, different interpretations of, 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 like, for example, the many worlds theory that you talked about. I know that, Brian, you talk a lot about brain theory and that, you know, spatially distributed universes where there could be copies of us, potentially. Um, so the, the part for you would be, um, which is the horse you're betting on in terms of if we were to ever be able to maybe prove that, um, whether it's the many worlds interpretation or uh, through brain theory, that we could indeed prove that there are copies of ourselves or multiple universes uh, and, and, and one day um, prove this fact. And then if we could, to Sam, um, would that be enough fodder to you know, write QED on the blackboard and say that all religious dogma kind of goes out the window since we would have infinite Jesus Christ and infinite you know, deities in each of these universes and uh, there can only be one true one according to the dogma. So would that maybe be enough that you could just yeah. slam on well, the table and walk out? Uh, unfortunately, in some of those universes, there are, well, this, this brings us to the other thing we didn't talk about, the, the simulation <laughs> argument, the idea that we might be living in a simulation. And uh, I mean, the concern there is that we could be living in a simulation run by you know, the Mormons of the future, where Mor Mormonism is true in this simulation. Uh, and there's a similar problem in, the, 
the many worlds interpretation, which is, correct me if I'm wrong, but if, every, if absolutely everything compatible with the laws of physics happens in these universes, isn't, it, isn't there some construal of, of quantum mechanics where Jesus is physically resurrected and that's not incompatible with it? I mean, there, there's some, there, there's some quantum sp spookiness that allows for things like a physical resurrection. Yeah, right? I mean, you don't even need to, to go to, to, to quantum mechanics in that incarnation. Mm. Uh, in, that, in, that, <laughs> in that version. Uh, you know... Um, Everybody get ready with Twitter, because what's about to come out is, is going to be good. Yeah, so, so one of the puzzles of modern cosmology is that if we allow inflationary cosmology, which is the bread and butter version of the theory that people are talking about, if that's the right way of thinking about the universe, then ours would just be one of many universes, there'd be many big bangs and many realms out there. And um, what that entails in principle is that if you wait long enough in a given universe, a uh, random particle motion, just random particle motion right. in a given universe, will coalesce into any physically realizable structure. Right. So, so you can so, just get Jesus appearing, or Jesus or Kim Kardashian just appearing out of the that, That's exactly yeah. right, uh, and I'm not joking about that. So we call it the Boltzmann brain problem after Ludwig Boltzmann, who died this day in 1906, hmm. uh, and he was the first person to really think about the fact that our universe itself may not have uh, originated from some uh, process in the, in the distant past, but the universe may have existed effectively for an eternity, and just the random particle motion at one weird moment happened to coalesce into a configuration that over time then evolved into everything that we are familiar with. And that is a rare fluctuation of the particles, but his point was, if you've got an eternity, rare things will happen. It, well, and not only will happen, I mean, every, that, every rare thing is guaranteed right. to happen. So then, yeah. then we take that one step further beyond what he said, which is effectively the point that you're making, which is in the far future, we, if the universe exists for an infinite amount of time into the far future, which these current theories suggest, then these random particle motions, sure, they could create another Big Bang, but it's even easier for them to create something less complex, not a whole universe, but just create a brain floating in the void. Right. So it could be that in the far future, the particles come together and they create a thinking brain that sort of has some thoughts. And it might think that it's here having this conversation. And that brain may just exist for a second or two and it disintegrates. But if the configuration of the particles is even more special, it'll last longer and longer. And if it's even more special still, it could think it's Jesus, it could be Jesus, or it could be Kim Kardashian, it could be any of these structures. Right. So, so yes, um, I'd rather you not tweet about it per se, because it has some nuance associated with it. But yeah, that would be in our future in these various ways of thinking about cosmology. Right. And, but also not just in the future, if space were big enough, Good. You just, yeah. you just go far enough in one direction, you're going to hit all those possibilities. Absolutely. So right? if space is infinitely big, right. which we don't know that it is, but again, in the, the most favored version of cosmology, that's a very natural outcome, that space is infinitely big. And there's an interesting thing that happens there, which is in, in any region, like our observable universe, the part that we can have interactions with, we have a lot of particles here. It's a number that you made reference to, 10 to the 80, 10 to yeah. the 88, some large number of particles in our universe. Quantum mechanics shows that there are only a finite number, a huge number, but there are only a finite number of configurations of those particles. Now, if space goes on infinitely far, imagine you have chunks of universe that are as big as ours, mm -hmm. populated by particles, and you ask yourself, can the particle configuration in each chunk be different? Well, if it goes on infinitely far, and there are only finitely many distinct configurations, there aren't enough distinct configurations to go around the particle configurations have to repeat. And if they have to repeat, that means that there's a version of us out there, and there's a version of effectively anything compatible laws of physics out there, and not just out there once, out there infinitely many times. I think you just made me a Scientologist. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, My work is done. Yeah. Thank you very much, guys.
Thanks. Hey guys, uh, great talk, appreciate it very much. Um, all right, so I might be a bit atopical. I'm gonna ask about animal rights. I guess uh, Brian is into animal rights a bit. So my question is, what is it that's true of an animal that if true of a human would justify stabbing them to death for a hamburger? And if you can name such a property, something that if true of humans uh, would justify doing this to them, would you be able to spell out the situation in which we do it to them without sounding completely psychopathic? Just to give a quick example, we'll not waste time. Uh, if you were to say intelligence, would it be okay to murder low intelligence people? If you were to say that it's the fact that it's natural, would it be you know, okay to murder humans if that were natural, mm. et cetera? Right. And I'll just, I'll just, I'll just say, um, when we went to dinner earlier, <laughs> He has the moral the vegan, high ground based the on vegan dinner. Yeah. Had to sit with three meat eaters, eating these like big ass steaks. All right, so um, toss it to you. Well, <laughs> so, <laughs> the, the amazing thing is, I, I briefly considered what to order in light of having to face this moment, and then I said, <laughs> okay. "Wasn't worth it." Yeah, right? Yes. No. Uh, why make it easy on myself? Uh, well, so there are many. So I'm, I'm basically a, a consequentialist, which means you know, I just think it, the, the cash value of a, a moral proposition is in the, the well-being of conscious creatures now or in the future, you know, you know, actual or possible, right? So I think there are things that can be, should be captured, they can be captured by, by consequentialism thought all the way through that aren't normally captured by it. So for instance, when you ask uh, why is it, uh, you know, why can't we just kill, if we, if we find people who have the characteristics of livestock, why can't we treat them exactly like livestock, right? So that's sort of a question you just asked. Well, uh, given the nature of what we are as social primates, treating people exactly like livestock has a different consequence on us and on our, a culture and on our capacity to, to live with one another than treating livestock like livestock. So it's not precisely the same problem, right? So if, if, and so, you know, and that's why cannibalism, I mean, there's, there's, there's a taboo around cannibalism that makes sense. I guess there could be some world in which we throw off this taboo and that we don't pay the kinds of consequences many of us feel we might pay, right? So you, we could just, you know, eat the, eat the, the dead, uh, because they're good protein and we're not at all sentimental about their bodies once we know they no longer have a basis for experience, right? Uh, but in this world, at this moment, given, it, given all the moving parts, if people start eating their parents when they die, we feel differently about them, right? And, and that begins to derange a lot of many other things we care about. So you have to take all the consequences in view. Now, I, I think that it's, it's impossible to defend factory farming as it is, I mean, d knowing the d details. I think that's, it's just, we want to solve that problem somehow, right? Um, you know, many, and yet, I happen to think that it's not at all obvious that we can all be vegans and be healthy, right? I mean, we're, you know, we were talking, for, to give the, the full picture, we were talking about the problem of being a parent and having vegan or vegetarian kids, right? Now, I, I, my view of that is that you're running a kind of science experiment on your kids, and it's not totally clear how it's gonna come out, right? And, and, and when I've run that experiment on myself, it's, you know, I, beca I became anemic when I, the first time I was a vegetarian for six years. I, the, the, all kinds of things go sideways in my blood when I, the last time I did this experiment for, for a year. Uh, now, no doubt with, with more intelligence or more attention to the details, most people can solve those problems for themselves as a, a vegan or a vegetarian, but perhaps not everyone can, right? And I think there may be another solution. I mean, I, I'm hopeful that, that uh, this whole this clean meat uh, uh, revolution that is struggling to be born will be one solution. So there's this, this company, Memphis Meats, whose CEO I had on my podcast, where they have a meatball that they have engineered 
out of, you, that does not entail the death of any animal, it entails the removal of a single cell from the, the, the right animal. They grow these cells in culture, and then you have, you know, unfortunately now it's still an $18,000 meatball, but <laughs> ultimately if it could be brought to scale, it would be a meat industry that wouldn't entail the, the suffering and, and death of, of billions of animals. There's this, if, if, you're, if you really are worried just about the experience of conscious creatures, there is a way of flipping this around. I have no illusions that this will convince you, a committed vegan or vegetarian, but this, you, you have to have an actual counter-argument if, if you stipulate the, uh, what I want you to stipulate here. If it's possible to raise livestock uh, under conditions where they're really living lives worth living, right? So that you can really have happy cows or happy ducks or chickens or pigs, uh, and it, which is to say it would be better for those animals to have been than to not have been. These are net positive lives. Well then, that's a world in which veganism is not actually the most compassionate solution. That, that, that would be a world in which bringing those billions of creatures into existence and giving them net positive lives would be better than, than, than not, if you think well-being aggregates in some way. If you, think, if, the, if you have the intuition that having a world with seven billion happy people is better than a world with two billion happy people, it's stipulating that happiness accrues in some sense, right? Um, you can run that same experiment. Now, I'm not saying we're anywhere near there with respect to our current practices, and I, you know, I would completely support every differentiation one wanted to make with respect to the ethics of treating animals well, but it's just, it's not a, given all of the moving parts, it's not a straightforward uh, question of saying, well, obviously everyone should be vegan right now. Well, I would just answer by saying, don't stab them for the hamburger. Yeah, Thanks, well, guys. That, yes, uh, I mean, that, that is a, a one answer, but I think it's, <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. Yeah, thanks to you both for coming. Sam, big fan on the, pod, the podcast. Um, my question is for you, actually. Um, and it has to do with AI. And when I think about your podcast, you talk to so many very intelligent, intellectual people on a number of different topics. And I'm interested to know what you are most excited about. You talked about um, you know, the pessimism uh, you know, related to human intelligence and what we are all aware of, and mm -hmm. obviously AI is going to, you know, really take us to the next level. Be it from, you know, the the CRISPR perspective of, you know, looking at um, all of the different uh, research that's being done here at home or outwardly at, uh, you know, planetary exploration. But from a standpoint, just for all of us in the room, what are you most excited about in, you know, the remaining years that you're here on Earth when you think about AI and the advancements and the potential that we have? What are you most excited about? Well, I, you know, I think it's the, the most important and amazing and necessary thing when you, when you think about it going well, right? Like, we have all of these problems for which intelligence at some, across some threshold is the only solution, right? Whether it's, you know, how to solve for certain diseases, you know, or, or stabilize our economy or understand climate well enough or make various scientific breakthroughs that would give us great benefit. Uh, I mean, and to think of building systems that can play all of these games that we care about and are right to care about and which protect everything else we care about uh, so much better than we can that it's just, it's, it's clear they, they need to do it. I mean, that, I mean, just when you look at what's happened with some, a very simple game like chess or uh, Go, you know, I mean, they, you know, Alpha Zero, so, so we've, been, we've been playing chess for, I don't know, what was it, something like a thousand years, right? And you have, this, you have the totality of human knowledge and ingenuity purposed on that very narrow task where, where people have gotten just amazingly good at this and people spend their whole lives getting you know, we have, the, we have the smartest people spending their whole lives at this fairly simple task and getting as good as humanly possible. And then we build computer programs that, that have studied every game we have a record of, and they get as good as 
as it seems they can possibly get on the basis of the totality of that knowledge, and they get a, a little bit better than people. And that's the situation that we had up until, you know, Google came up with, with AlphaGo and then AlphaZero, and AlphaZero was a program that didn't have any chess knowledge in it, right? Didn't study all of humanity's record of, of genius with chess. It just played itself for four hours and then beat the best bespoke chess computer ever made, right? Um, or played it, you know, something like 100 games and, and, you know, to a draw, you know, 28 times and, and you know, then beat it, you know, 72 other times. Um, so you just, just imagine having that kind of breakthrough in every other area that we care about, you know, whether it's solving mathematical theorems or, you know, protein folding problems and developing new drugs, everything, right? It's, intelligence is the only game in town when you want to solve problems. And there's, there's no reason to think that it's not substrate independent, which is to say there's no reason to think that all the intelligence we care about, that, that there's every reason to think that intelligence across the board is just like chess, right? It's just like that we now know that computers can be much better than we will ever be at chess or at Go. Uh, and there's every reason to think that everything else we're doing on the basis of information processing is just like that. Um, I mean, I think, you know, that's, that's an assumption, but I think, it's a, I think it's a good assumption to make. And once you make that assumption, then you just see all of the ways in which we can solve uh, just uh, problems we can't even dream of solving now. Uh, and that'll, that will be an amazing world to live in. It's also very interesting that if we get any significant piece of that wrong, we are just ushering in this, this just dystopian hellscape for ourselves, very likely, right? So, so th and there, there are all kinds of moral problems we need to solve because we need to build our values into these intelligent systems. We can't have, you know, they have to be, cons they have to be tethered to what we want and our own notion of our own well-being. And they, and they have to be something that we can be in dialogue with so as to refine our notion of what we want and what we should want in the, in the future. I mean, that, that's the, the ultimate thing for me would be to have an intelligent system that would be a kind of oracle or a kind of genie where you could be in dialogue with it and it could sort of map out for you sort of where you are in, the, in, the, in this part of the landscape of, of possible experience and where it is you might find worth going based on what's you know, possible for a, a brain like yours and a brain like yours in, in perhaps you know, very real you know, mechanical dialogue or you know, electromagnetic dialogue or pharmacological dialogue with, with you know, a system more intelligent than yourself. So I, mean, I think the, the life could get very, very strange and very, very wonderful. But again, there's like, there's like this tightrope walk into the strange and wonderful and off the rope is just this plunge into weirdness and that's not at all you know, humanistic uh, or even compatible with, with our basic sanity. So I think it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's thrilling because it's a, re it's a problem where science and moral philosophy totally intersect, right? Like this is philosophy on a deadline, as somebody recently said. Um, that might have been Nick Bostrom. Uh, and I, I think you know, there's a lot of problems we have to get right and even to, even to think about this stuff. And it, and it relates to the question that was just asked about you know, the ethics of killing animals. I mean, the, the, we, we could live to see a time where there's, there's, a, there's a just as poignant an ethical question about turning off your com computer. You know, are you committing a murder when you turn off a computer of sufficient sophistication, right? Um, or are we inadvertently building machines that can suffer, you know, and, that, and that's a, a huge problem, so. Yeah. Hello, Sam. My question relates to your claim about our lack of free will. Given such partial it is true, how do we draw the line between the incompatible nature of free will with reality as we understand it versus our lack of free will and its irreconcilable nature with a functioning pragmatism? In other words, if the most evil man we can envision is simply a Darwinistic and or environmental error who happened to inherit a concoction of variances which he did not choose, how do we finally calibrate our moral scruples on an obvious contradiction between well-being and uh, responsibility? As an example, if we were to create a pill that could cure the next kid who would potentially be Charles Whitman, 
uh, it seems a net positive for everyone in doing so. However, if we try to run the same logic with Hitler and Saddam Hussein post-atrocities, our moral edifice seems to fall right under our feet. Granted, such situations are anomalous, but I would argue the same logic can be applied at a lesser degree on most criminals. So I have two questions for you. Number one, could it be that... I love this. What, what's amazing here is what you're doing now, people really often hate, but you're doing it so well that it's just fun. So just keep going. <laughs> So I, I'm, I'm, ask your question. I'm very nervous right now, which is why I'm trying to speak so fast. No, no, it's great. Okay. Um, number one, could it be that the pragmatic implications of a nonchalant happiest can be Hitler roaming around, uh, jeopardize society, and therein overturn his lack of responsibility for having done so in the first place? And number two, where do you draw the boundary between our ethical commitment to curing the ill and the devastating reper repercussions their misapprehensions can cause on society? Right, okay, well uh, that's a, a great question about the, the implications of dispensing with free will on our morality and on our politics and on our solving problems together. Well, so I think, I don't know where, we, we, we haven't talked about this, but I don't know if free will makes as little sense to you as it does to me. I think, I think free will is a, I, I think there's no way to think about the propagation of causes in this world that makes any deep sense of this notion of free will. And I, I think if we, we yeah. understood ourselves if you grant that you know, nobody picks their parents, nobody picks their genes, nobody picks the environmental influences to the system that's specified by, by genes and development. Yeah, I mean, I, we're each a bag of particles governed by the laws of physics, and that's right. all there is to it. Yeah, and, and even if you added you know, ectoplasm or immortal souls, I mean, no, nobody picks their souls you know, or soul. Um, or even put quantum mechanics, the randomness of quantum mechanics is not what we mean by volitional choice. Exactly, right. So, so we're sort of on the same page, it sounds like. <laughs> so, you know. But we had to say that. Yeah. And if, if, we, if you returned our brains to precisely the state they're in at this moment, we would, we would make the noises that we're making in precisely the same way. No. Time. Well, but adding randomness, I do not agree randomness doesn't help. Randomness doesn't help, but we wouldn't make the same noises. We would make different noises, but we couldn't choose what noises right. we would make, okay. and that's very different. Those noises would be dictated by the, the totality of influences to the system in that moment. Are you, are you adding quantumness, or are you adding... Yes, exactly. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah, so this whole idea okay. of rerunning the tape and running it forward again does not yield the same progression, but it doesn't yield the progression that we have volitional choice of. Right, got it, okay. So, so quantum mechanics doesn't... make that clear. Yeah, quantum mechanics doesn't get you, get you the freedom you think you have yes, either. exactly. Uh, <laughs> So, but, but you have this additional piece where you, we have these cases where, you know, someone does something heinous, like they, I mean, there was a, uh, there was a case that uh, I talked about with um, Robert Sapolsky on my podcast that, that uh, it was in the news where some, you know, otherwise totally normal guy started getting really fixated on child pornography, right? So the, there was, you know, child pornography was found on his work computer or whatever, he got fired, and then he started doing all kinds of inappropriate things and they discovered he had a brain tumor, and the, the judge in this case didn't find the brain tumor totally exculpatory for somebody. Like, I, I, like the judge sort of split the baby and put him in jail for eight years when it could have been, you know, for the rest of his life. And, you know, R Robert and I both talked about what a bizarre miscarriage of justice that was. Uh, but it is an intuition that we all have that, that once you understand the causes of bad behavior clearly enough, once you find a brain tumor that's big enough and in just the right place, as, as was the case with Charles Whitman, uh, who you referenced, that seems exculpatory. That seems like, okay, this, this person's just suffering bad luck. He's just he's got a bad roll of the dice biologically. He's not the, the really evil person who deserves to be punished. Um, well, my argument is that if you understood all of the causal connections that dictate our behavior, you would arrive at that same epiphany with respect to every evil thing that every person does. And what's more, if we had a cure for those causes, right, if there was a cure, I mean, right now there's no cure for psychopathy. We just have people who are psychopaths, you know, evil people who are reliably doing terrible things because they're selfish and they, they don't feel the kind of empathy that most of us feel for the suffering of others. Um, well, then, uh, if we had a, something we could put in the water so as to just knock psycho psychopathy just out of the theater of human events, 
we would do that, and we would then view psychopathy as a condition like diabetes, right? There's no, not much praise or blame associated with having it. It's just, a bad, it's just bad luck, right? Now, your concern is that, I think, that we need, you know, it, we're in this sort of no man's land where we don't totally understand the basis of human behavior, and what's more, we don't have remedies for, for people being bad. Uh, right. yeah. my, my thing is, I, I understand your case with Charles Whitman and say maybe right. a 13 But with Hitler, it's, it's, yeah. it's hard, exactly. right. And I mean, I would, I would grant you that there are, on some level, we do just want to do what works, right? I mean, and, and there's, so like, the, the question is, to, the question of whether to punish bad people isn't a question of, about free will. It's not, it's not saying they could do otherwise. The question is, and then it's, therefore it's not a question of them really deserving to be punished once you catch them, because they really are bad. The question is, what are the effects of punishment? And, and in many cases, the effects are what we want them to be, right? Punishment, certain kinds of punishments reliably dissuade people from doing bad things when they're dissuadable. Now, some people are not dissuadable, Right? And some punishments are so out of register with the thing we're trying to, to prevent that they derange something else about our society. I mean, if we, we can't make, you know, if it was a matter of capital punishment for, you know, cutting into line at, at the bank, right, well then, you know, no one would ever cut into line, but, you know, we, we would live in a, in a horrific society, right? And there's some societies that kind of approximate that. I mean, so, you know, there are authoritarian societies like Singapore where they, you know, they, they seem to cane you or kill you for just about anything, right? And it's very orderly, right? And so, like, there are people who will talk about the upside of killing people for marijuana possession because it works so damn well in Singapore. Uh, now, I don't think they have it, you know, the dial tuned to quite the right spot there, but uh, again, it, it comes down to what sort of world you want to live in, and I think but, but I think this conversation is only going to be going in one direction. It's not like we're going to learn less and less about ourselves, right? And the more and more we learn about ourselves, it's going to fill in the, the blank spaces on the map in a reliable way, and they, it'll be in a way that makes things look like there's no deep agency, there's no deep, deep responsibility, and there's no bright line between when someone becomes the victim of circumstance. You know, the, the, I mean, the example I often use is, I mean, Saddam Hussein, when he's 40 years old, is a scary bastard who just deserves to be hung, right? Because he has, he's made enough people suffer, he, he has this coming to him. But you roll back the clock in his life, well, you know, he's 18, well, he's still pretty scary and, you know, probably deserves to be hung, right? But when he's four, he is just the unlucky boy who has bad genes and bad parents and a bad society, who is destined to become Saddam Hussein on some right. level, right? And, th and the more we learn about ourselves is going to make the kind of the, the timeline look more and more like the boy's timeline right. and less and less like the scary man's timeline. I mean, that's, that's what I would argue, but that, that I guess remains to be Brian seen. Brian and so. Sam, we got, a, oh, we got oh. a minute to finish yeah. up here. If you guys have any uh, final thoughts for the evening. Okay, so sorry, we, we just got to the end of uh, the voice of God tells us that we're, we're um, <laughs> time is real. Do you have any, any, any closing point that you want to make? No, I'm good. Good. <laughs> awesome. All right, All right, everyone, please give a big round of applause to Brian coming. Green and Sam Harris. Thank you so much.